Hello, hello there. It's your main man, Marky, and welcome back to another episode of r slash Am I the A-Hole. If you love today's bloody good content, I want you to smash that like button, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's bloody good episode of r slash Am I the A-Hole. Thank you. Our first post today is by user Equalad4766, titled, Am I the A-Hole for taking my mum's side and telling my wife that my mum did not verbally abuse her? So... My mum and my wife have never been close, but I don't think either of them have been in the wrong until this situation. They just don't click. My wife is really into making soap. She sells it on social media and recently quit her job to sell soap full time. My mum has literally never said anything negative about the soap, but when she was asked to buy it, she declined. My wife is like a dog with a bone, trying to get my mum to buy this soap. She asks her every time we see her, and when my mum declines, my wife starts listing the virtues of the soap and trying to force my mum to smell it. She has also brought my mum's finances into it, and argued that my mum and stepdad both make good money, and speculated about how much my mum spends on her wardrobe, which really isn't our business. Well, my mum stopped by the other day to see the kids. Before she left, she used our bathroom, and my wife stood outside the door yelling the whole time about, How's the soap in there? And don't you like it? My mum came out looking pissed, and my wife immediately offered her a friends and family discount. My mum screamed, I don't want your effing soap. If you aren't making enough money from the soap, that isn't my problem, and I don't want to hear about the effing soap again. And then my mum left. My wife immediately asked what I was going to do, and I said that I would talk to my mum, but my wife should have dropped it with the soap. My wife said that wasn't good enough, and that my mum had committed verbal abuse. I replied that I don't consider that verbal abuse, and now my wife is very upset, and feels like I'm taking my mum's side, and that I should set boundaries with my mum. But I feel like my mum kind of set a boundary when she said she didn't want to buy the soap, and my wife didn't give an F about that. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I do believe that your nuclear family comes first, and ultimately, my wife is way more important than my mum, and I would not want to devalue her experience. I mean, that's genuinely a fair point there. And in a lot of situations, that is the go-to rule. It's kind of like, you know, she's in your court and your mum is in another court. Your wife is more important and you don't want to devalue your wife's experience. But this one to me, this is a situation where you can make an exception to that rule. I feel like it's not an entire make or break situation. It's akin to the stupid MLM crap that goes on. Your wife is acting like an MLM snake oil peddler and being like, how's the soap? Oh, you don't like the soap? Just try the soap. It's so good for you. Oh my God, the soap. I'll give you a friends and family discount. Your mom is right to be pissed off. Your mom tried to set boundaries. Your wife didn't respect those boundaries and continued to push those boundaries. This to me is not a situation where your wife is justified in her actions. She's continuously being pushy, she's trying to peddle something that your mum doesn't want, and your wife is being a dick. Your wife is turning this into a situation it doesn't need to be. That was not verbal abuse, that was her being shut down after she continues to harass your mum. F your wife. She needs to be put into the naughty corner with a bloody dunce hat on because she's acting like the village idiot. I have no remorse for that woman, I would have done the exact same that your mum did, because that's effing annoying. So good on you, OP. Not the a-hole. Lipstick On says, Right. Well, your wife was verbally harassing her, so she got what she deserved. Not the a-hole. Your wife needed to hear that. She's probably all up her friends' asses about her soap and driving them away too. Your wife needs to learn that no means no. It could be the best soap in the whole world, but nobody's going to buy it from an annoying nag especially if that person is standing outside the bathroom when I'm peeing, yelling at me to smell the soap. That's crossing a boundary. I like to pee in peace. I'm guessing OP's mum wanted the same, not the a-hole. You stand outside the bathroom yelling at me while I'm peeing, I'm coming out and shitting in your hands. <laughs> Lol. How's that smell, Carol? <laughs> Lionel Messy Peters says, 
You're the a-hole for not stopping your wife from harassing your mother over the soap earlier. Not the a-hole for taking your mum's side though. Exactly. He should have gotten involved way before it got to this point. Yeah. My partner's happiness would be a priority for me, but not at the cost of my mother's patience, or rather anyone's patience. More than that, it's the fact that it's pretty clearly not really about the soap as much as the sales. If OP's wife was just really proud of the soap, eager for OP's mum to try it, and offered OP's mum a gratuitous bar that OP's mum rejected, that would be one thing. But the talk about the mum's finances and offer of a friends and family discount, evidently after trying to sell it to her full price up until that point, makes this really ugly on OP's wife's part. If you're demanding compensation, you have no right to be offended when someone declines the transaction no matter who they are. Flexible Corn says, I'll talk to mum about it was a weak response that lets your wife think she's in the right. You should have stood up to your wife about her constant pestering, especially after your wife asked you what you were going to do about it. Millennial Bullcrape says, Not the a-hole. So your wife can make soap. She should learn how to sell it. Spoiler alert, it's not by irritating people into submission. If she sells it at a farmer's market, does she chase people screaming at them to buy soap? <laughs> that mental image I got was priceless. I can imagine a lady at a farmer's market chasing people around and shouting, Doesn't it smell nice? It's the lavender! And our last comment by Lucy2171 says, It's weird that your wife keeps pressuring your mum to buy the soap. The way she is acting is almost like she's part of an MLM company. Also, it is totally overstepping the line bringing your parents' finances into it but I also find it bizarre your mother wouldn't buy any soap and support her business. I know she doesn't have to, but you'd think she would want to support her daughter-in-law. I was thinking the wife had MLM vibes too. She sounds like the essential oil people. Now, I had the same thought too about it was odd that mum didn't try to support the wife's business to begin with, but maybe she just truly didn't like the smell or texture of the soaps. It's not a big deal to buy one bar than never use it, but... If she bought one, the wife would expect her to buy more. Most people don't buy stuff knowing they aren't going to use it, unless it's from a kid's fundraiser or something similar. After the first refusal, mum probably just buckled down on principle. It's pretty much that. Since soap is a constant buy, plus the daughter might feel insulted if the mum just never used the soap too. The mum is screwed either way, lol. Our next post is by user, New Job A Hole, titled, Am I the A Hole for telling my old boss that it's just business? So I got my first job out of college at a relatively small, privately owned business in my field. I had interviewed at larger companies, but I liked the smaller company feel, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to get experience in a lot of different areas so that I could advance my career or even step into a larger role at the company sooner than I could at a large one. The current owner of the company had purchased it from the founder a couple years before I arrived, so he inherited a lot of the clients and contracts that the original owner had acquired. The owner didn't believe in annual employee reviews, and always said that if anyone had an issue, to just talk with him whenever. So after I had been there for about 18 months, I called a meeting with him and asked for a raise. He told me he would think about it and get back to me. He called me into his office a couple days later and said he ran some numbers and that he could only afford to offer me a token raise and some extra vacation time with the promise that he would reevaluate things in a year. He told me it was just business, no hard feelings. This was frustrating to me because I had already been heading many of our more lucrative contracts and projects, and I knew we were bringing in a lot of revenue that was directly related to my work. About six months later, one of our clients that had been with the company since the previous owner, and that I had been working closely with since I started, approached me about taking a position with them that would be a huge jump up for me professionally. I thought about it for maybe a week, and decided to take it. I put in my two-week notice, and my boss was pissed. He called me ungrateful, and that I was leaving them high and dry. 
With one week left, he told me not to bother coming back into the office for the final week, even though I was in the middle of helping people transition into my projects. At my new job, one of the first tasks was evaluating the contract that my previous job had. I asked my new boss if there was any kind of conflict of interest, but he said I wasn't the only one working on it, and he wanted my opinion. So I tried to be as diligent as I could, and found that there were better and more affordable options for us than my previous job. The other people evaluating the contract found the same thing, so the higher-ups decided to not renew the contract with my previous boss. When he found out about it, my old boss reached out to me and called me a traitor, and accused me of purposefully telling my new boss to end the contract out of spite against him. I told him I don't appreciate being accused of such things, and that it was just business. No hard feelings. A former co-worker reached out to me shortly after, and said that with the lost revenue from the contract, it's possible the company may need to lay people off, or close altogether. He said my old boss fully blames me for it. I feel like I was just doing my job, and did nothing wrong. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I think I might be the a-hole for telling my new job that the contract they had with my old boss is a bad one. I'll be real, I wasn't expecting you to think that you're the a-hole for that. I thought you'd think you're the a-hole for saying, um, nothing personal, it's just business? And yeah, I know it sucks that the run-on effect from that is that a bunch of people get laid off and the boss blames it on you. You kind of did set yourself up to be a target there by saying that to him, but, you know, sometimes spite like that feels good. If this is the environment where it's okay to burn that bridge and it won't screw you in the future, then thumbs up for that. But there's situations where doing something like this will come back to bite you. With the way that businesses are, you do kind of want to be saving as much money as possible and getting the best, you know, bang for your buck through a contract. It's not particularly your fault that this contract fell through with the old business. You genuinely were just doing your job. And if anything, uh, that old boss should be blaming the company for finding someone better and then he should be doing business better and matching that contract. Ultimately, this all comes down to your old boss, I would say. I'd say you're a bit of a dick for saying it back to him, but it was well-deserved, so I'm gonna go with not the a-hole for this one. Secret Outlet 736 says, Not the a-hole. Your ex-boss didn't appreciate the work you did, so you left. You and a few other people found better options, you didn't do this out of spite. I'd say you did your job, and he's just butthurt about it. Professionally, OP needs to look after his own career and interest. Consequently, that means doing a good job and looking after the interest of his current employer. Ex-boss made everything personal, which is bad business conduct. His entire conduct is very unprofessional, stemming from how he handled the raise request to accusing OP of sabotaging his business. The success of the business is sometimes a reflection of ownership. Completely apart from moral, that's what you get kind of judgment, a company that will die if one of their clients finds a better option is already dead. Carib92 says, Not the a-hole. Please don't be guilted by this. I've worked for a small private company as well, led a massive project which was also one of the most profitable and didn't see a diamond bonus. Left the company right after. Small companies always have the same excuses not making enough money, limited contracts, etc., but then they pull up in the most expensive cars, take the most expensive trips, etc. They forget that it's the team that holds the company afloat. You did the right thing. I'm a no-nonsense type of employee, so I would have done the same. My last boss, owner, was practically wiping his crocodile tears with $100 bills when he told me he feels bad that he can afford a new BMW while others, me, second in command, at our company, can't. Ridiculous. Bosses forget that a company can be without its employees, and employees that are treated well usually go above and beyond for those that value them. This is why I've stayed with my side job for 11 years. My boss makes sure the team is taken care of, treating us to lunch, and encouraging us to strengthen our skill sets. She has our backs and we've fought for her and work our tails off to make sure the business succeeds. 
Hell. She even came to my dissertation defense and took notes. It wasn't anything close to her field, but she came and participated. That generates serious loyalty. And Two Buck Bill says, Not the a-hole. Your old boss had to do the best thing that he could for his company, and your loyalty to the company ended with your last paycheck. Now your loyalty is to your new company, and you have to do the best that you can for your new employer. Since what you found was a common finding amongst a capable group, it sounds like your previous employer was simply not offering the product or service that he could or should have. His old boss did not do the best thing for the company. The best thing would have been giving OP a good enough raise and making sure he kept him and the contract. He did the best thing to line his own pockets. Posted by user 61709713. Titled, Am I the a-hole for uninviting my sister to my wedding for what she told my fiancé? Now, my, male 27, fiancé, female 25, has an obvious permanent burn scar from an accident that caused her mother, her only parent, to pass away from injury. My fiancé had a long recovery, and it's been seven years. The scar is on her collarbone. It goes down her chest but isn't showing. Unless she's wearing scoop slash square tops. She often wears hoodies and jackets to cover up. She puts this cream, I don't know what ladies call it, but it's supposed to turn skin colour or something. I'm not sure, but my fiancé calls it foundation that's one degree brighter than her skin colour. I absolutely adore her, she's pretty, smart, ambitious, and the list goes on. What happened was unfortunate, and I'm glad she's at peace with herself and more confident. My family love her. How can they not? She's a member of the family. My mom makes sure she takes part in every family function and things like shopping and decorating other things. However, my sister made comments about my fiancé's scar several times. I've called her out on her behaviour several times to get her to stop because she was hurting me before my fiancé with her backhanded and insensitive comments. I told my fiancé she had every right to cut my sister out and not deal with her bullcrap, but she has been forgiving and respectful of my entire family. Our wedding is in February. My fiancé went shopping for the wedding dress. This is where the issue started. My fiancé showed the wedding dress to my sister. I didn't see it, but I was told it was a spaghetti strap dress. My fiancé likes this stuff. Anyways, my sister saw it and went nuts, and she started criticising her choice and said that she should have gotten a high nick or a jewel wedding dress to cover up the scar. She argued with my fiancé about it. I went to my family's house and I confronted her. I yelled at her after she told me my fiancé needed to return the dress and get a proper one so that guests won't focus on her burn scar and use it as the topic of conversation and gossip. I told her that she's not invited to our wedding. She isn't welcome to my wedding with this entitled attitude of hers and her insensitivity and disrespect. We argued for half an hour and then I left. In exactly an hour, my mum and dad called and berated me, saying my sister was crying after I uninvited her and that I had no right to uninvite her. She's my sister and was just trying to help out and give an advice and avoid any unnecessary drama at the wedding. My mum said my fiancé can keep the dress but suggested to wear a pride shawl as a neutral solution. I stopped responding to my mum's calls and texts after that. Family members were upset that my sister was uninvited and wanted me to invite her again because this will make family look bad in front of outsiders and guests. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. My family says what I did was disrespectful for the whole family and its reputation and I needed to fix it. I personally feel that this is a situation where OP should definitely not try and cover up for this family. If there were a time, this would be it to humiliate the family in front of outsiders and guests. OP, you can't let your sister get away with this unnecessary drama before the wedding just to avoid it at the wedding. And then OP's parents and the extended family members enabling that behaviour and defending the sister especially your mum saying wear a pride shawl as a neutral solution, 
How about no? How about the mum goes and finds a neutral solution that shuts the sister up? If OP's wife intentionally didn't want to cover up, and the argument was about covering up, why is a neutral solution covering it up? That doesn't make any sense. That's giving the sister what she wants. It's good that you stopped responding to the calls and texts after that. If the family members want to go and make drama about this, uninvite them from the wedding too. They don't need to be there if they're going to drag your day down. Not the a-hole. And in the comments, Broken Ale says, Not the a-hole, and uninvite anyone who insults your fiancé, in my opinion. And OP replies, I'm definitely standing my ground. This is mine and my fiancé's big day. Not the a-hole. Also, foundation is exactly what it sounds like. A foundation for the rest of your makeup, etc., usually used to even out skin tones to make blemishes less obvious. And Judy Valuable replies, Not the a-hole. And thank you for sticking up for your fiancé. Tell your family members that your sister thinks your fiancé should be ashamed of a scar from a tragic accident and should hide it. So you disinvited her until she apologises. And if they don't see anything wrong with what your sister said, take this as an opportunity to trim the guest list and save more money. By the way, Princess Eugenie of England had surgery done on her spine as a child, and has scars because of it. When she got married a few years ago, she deliberately wore a backless dress because her scars are a part of who she is, and she's not ashamed of them. As a princess, her dress had to be approved by the Queen of England because of her station, and because the entire world would be watching her wedding. The Queen did not think there was anything inappropriate about her wearing a dress that showcased several scars down her back. If a dress like that is proper and appropriate enough for the Queen, I think your mother and sister could keep their mouths shut and accept whatever your lovely bride wants to wear. I hope you both have a long and wonderful life together. Obitadicta says, Not the a-hole. Your mum is ridiculous to suggest your fiancé needs to compromise with anyone on her wedding dress. OP is not the a-hole. His sister and mother now, those two surely are. That rotten apple didn't fall far from the tree. And Serge RN for the win says, What a small person your sister is. Your fiancé's burn scar is a badge of courage. I work in surgery, and I've done many, many burn reconstructions. That's not an easy road to go down, and your fiancé should be praised for going through all that and coming out the other side with her gracious nature intact. Your sister owes you and your fiancé a huge apology. Your mother can offer one as well. This ill factor is childish and reprehensible. Not the a-hole at all. And Mimosa Usagi replies, She sounds jealous of the fiancé. OP, does your sister have a history of criticising or being rude to your girlfriends? I know a few girls that seem to hate any girls their brothers brought home, and I was always put off by them because it seemed like they resented anyone that took attention away from them for even a split second. Also, Depending on OP's sister's ages, she might just be parroting what she hears at home. That also goes hand in hand with OP's mum asking for a shawl and the worry they will not look good in front of the others. So while they may be acting friendly and comfortable in front of OP, behind his back, they may be doing complete opposite. Not the a-hole. I'm a burn survivor, and my scars are on my chest and upper arm. I can't begin to explain the mental toll that these so-called helpful comments have on a person. I've had many people pull my blouse closed over my scars because they were showing, or suggest what I should and shouldn't wear because of them. I've had comments about how at least it didn't damage my face and I can hide my scars. It took years to be okay with my scars. What your family is doing is abusive and psychologically damaging. Your sister is not being helpful, she's being cruel, and your parents need a huge wake-up call if they think this cruelty is acceptable. You're right to put your foot down and not allow your sister or anyone else to abuse your fiancé under the guise of being helpful. And our last post is by user TerribleMother238474, titled... Am I the a-hole for making my mother homeless after she mocked the death of my fiancé? 
So this happened today, so it's all still too fresh. I apologize in advance since my English is not my native language. Back when the pandemic started, my mom was evicted and I offered her to stay at my place until she sorted things out. During this time, August last year, my fiancé of six years passed unexpectedly after contracting the plague, and I have been totally depressed since then, basically focusing on work so that I don't have to think about it. It still really hurts. It doesn't help that my mum has been talking a lot of things about vaccines and how the corona is a hoax, how it's a Chinese plan to dominate the world, etc. It's exhausting. It didn't stop when my fiancé died, which I thought it would. Back when it happened, she said something along the lines of, she died because she was scared. She probably died of something else. According to her, only people that are afraid of the virus dies. I've put up with this because otherwise she would be homeless and I thought I could ignore the drama. Cue to today. I got home and there was a big fancy cake at the dinner table. I was confused and thought maybe I forgot her birthday, since I'm not thinking straight in the past few months. Mum was in the other room when I asked what the cake was about and she came to the living room doing a funny dance, all excited and said that it was to celebrate the 200,000 deaths in my country reached today. I live in Brazil. I stood still for some time, thinking I heard wrong. I asked her again what it was, and she asked me if I haven't seen the news. We've reached this milestone today, and she wanted to celebrate all the idiots that died to this hoax. I was taken aback. I grabbed the cake and threw it straight at the wall. She started screaming. I tried to remain as calm as I could and asked if she was mentally ill or if she needed help. How could she think it would be funny to celebrate something like this, especially since I'm still mourning? She told me I should get over it, and if she died, it was just because she was a weak person. So I was better off and she would probably have better grandkids. I decided to escort her out of my house, gave her some money, and told her to stay the night at a hotel and only come back in the morning to grab her stuff. I also told her to never contact me again. I spent the last few hours grabbing all of her stuff and putting it on the outside of the apartment so that she can collect it tomorrow. As of right now, at least three family members have reached out to me, telling me I'm a terrible person for throwing out the person that raised me. They said that the cake is just her dark sense of humour, and that I'm a fool for not entertaining it. I told them all some terrible things, and to take care of her if they're so fond of her sense of humour. Of course, now I'm questioning what kind of person leaves their mum homeless, but I really don't want to see her ever again. Am I the a-hole? And Dopey has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I was called an a-hole by family members who think it's absurd to make my mother homeless, but I think I was in the right. Unfortunately, no one so far seems to agree with me, so I thought about asking in this subreddit. I mean, genuinely, in a time like this, it can be seen as a very heartless thing to be kicking your mother out, and there never really does seem to be a good reason for it, but... I would say that this is a good reason to be kicking your mother out, especially when she has other people to go to. There are other family members who are dogpiling on you, so of course she can and probably will go to them. They're just as much in the wrong here if they deny her that. But celebrating hitting a 200,000 death milestone, and on top of that, rubbing your life partner's death in your face and saying she deserved it and saying that she was weak and you can go find someone else and have better grandkids with them, that is, that is rock bottom, that is stone cold harsh. I would hope that if you told the family that, that they would be on your side and be like, you know what, that was warranted. But then again, that might lead them to attack you more, not take her in, leave her homeless further, who knows? This kind of seems like a lose-lose situation. It's incredibly depressing, and I hope you can get through it, but as it stands, I don't think you're the a-hole for this one. Ronit Sarangi in the comments says, Now I'm questioning what kind of person leaves their mum homeless. The kind of person whose mum mocks the death of 200,000 people, which includes a dear loved one. 
your mum can take her dark sense of humour to a hotel and to those who entertain it. What is wrong with those people? You're not the a-hole, OP. Do not take her back. This mother is clearly a Bolsonaro supporter because this is the kind of evil bullcrap that he's been pushing to his people. As soon as I read the title of the post, I knew OP would turn out to be not the a-hole. Kicking the mother out was totally the right thing to do, and OP should cut her and any family members siding with her from her life. Ryan503 says, Not the a-hole. Absolutely not. This is disgusting behaviour, and you do not want it in your life at all. I doubt she'll change, but maybe it'll be a wake-up call to your mum. I'm sorry about your fiancé. Disgusting is an awesome word to use. As I read it, I kept thinking, this is absolutely effed. What kind of monster of a mother would do any of those things, never mind all of them? OP, not the a-hole, and go no contact without ever looking back. And AMB Lily says, Oh my god, not the a-hole. I was expecting you to be exaggerating when I read the title, but the more I read, the more horrible it got. You should have thrown the cake at her. I'm so sorry for your loss. Our first post is by user AKL7760913, titled, Am I the a-hole for spending $600 weekly on my son and not his brothers? So, I'm a single dad with three sons. In order, Jack 23, Austin 19, Kevin 16. Kevin has a severe learning disability, low-functioning autism. I look after him at home after he was failed by three care homes because there was neglect. The last care home hadn't managed to wash his hair in four weeks or give him a shower in three weeks, and other problems that were never addressed, and a complicit argument with SC who were awful and nasty. I couldn't let him live like that. Jack and Austin both live at home. They didn't want him to return home, and were being negative towards him. They said since he's back home, they won't be involved in his care. I'm not sure why they want this for their brother to be treated as less than just because of his special needs. I know it's not easy for them, for Kevin and me, but he's their brother. I started looking after him myself. Routine has changed, but I managed it first. I started working from home so I could spend more time with him, but it didn't work. Also because I'm solely taking care of him and everyone else in the house doesn't help with simple tasks. It's just exhausting to be doing everything alone. I decided to hire a paid carer that takes about $600 weekly. Austin and Jack knew about it, and they were upset with me, asking me why I was spending that much money on Kevin alone and demanded equality and to be given the same amount of money weekly too. I was stunned when they both lashed out at me for playing favourites and treating Kevin differently, saying he was my spoiled favourite. They started complaining about needing money to fix their phones, new TV, a new dishwasher, etc. I told them that I had no choice since no one wanted to participate in his care, and that they're capable adults who can start earning their own money if they wanted. They said they weren't obligated to take part in his care, so I should stop holding that over their heads, and demanded that I give them the same amount of money weekly. We argued back and forth, and they both took turns to try to guilt me for what I did. They refused to drop it, and other family members got involved. My sister berated me, saying I was being unfair and that their reaction is understandable. They are both 23 to 19. They can move out if they want. They don't pay rent or groceries. The arguments seem to be going nowhere. They've been giving me the silent treatment since then, and say that I'm playing favourites. I need to mention that I in no way asked or expected Jack and Austin to be responsible for their brother. I never asked them, so I have no idea why they keep saying I'm trying to get back at them for refusing to help. It's not like that at all. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I tried to reason with them, and I might be an a-hole for not understanding their feelings and arguing further. 
I'm going to go purely off of what we've read here and say OP is not the a-hole for this situation. Um, those two are acting like entitled brats, and we don't have any information further that would indicate why they don't want to look after this sibling. I feel like it's a tricky and intense situation to be stuck in, and I really hope that Kevin gets the help that he needs. It's not right for those two to be demanding $600 each, when that $600 is going to look after Kevin, who obviously needs the help, and they don't want to provide it, and OP still has a job and can't always provide that care. It's a rock and a hard place situation, and I don't think there really is any winning in this one. So, for that I have to say not the a-hole. PurpleMP12 says, They're adults. Adults living in a home should be helping with cooking, cleaning, etc., regardless of the situation. Even kids should, but adults really should. No, they don't need to help with his care, but they do need to do other household tasks. Kevin is a minor child with special needs. Of course you should spend more money on him. Do they have jobs? How do they come to expect you to support them into adulthood rent-free? I understand the 19-year-old not paying rent, but not the 23-year-old. No, neither of them have jobs. I've been understanding and didn't want to make them feel as if I'm being controlling and treating them differently from Kevin. But it obviously got out of control. I'm dealing with so much and I really can't take this anymore. Dude, they can get jobs. That's not being controlling. It's making sure they're responsible adults, which they're not right now. It's not like Kevin can even get a job, so they should be thankful they have that ability. I've already talked to them about this. Jack wants to get a job, but it's Austin who keeps demanding things from me and being in Jack's ear about the difference in treatment. It's clear to me that Jack has been affected by what his brother tells him. Gone Baby Thoughts says, Not the a-hole. You're under a lot of pressure here for many reasons, most of which are outside of your control. It's clear that your other sons see Kevin as a burden, wanting nothing to do with him, but also as a threat from the perspective of your time, money, and attention. I suspect this goes back to their childhood where they always felt like his special needs meant they got less than. I think family therapy is highly in order here. Your sons do not appear to have the emotional maturity to manage themselves properly in this situation, and the last thing you need is more stress. Hoping you're able to sit them down, have an open and productive chat with them, and get the ball moving on seeing someone that can help you navigate this. And OP says, I've mentioned therapy for them, and Austin laughed, saying there was nothing wrong with them to seek counselling, and that I'm the one being neglectful and playing favourites. Playing favourites with your minor disabled son? Austin sounds like an entitled narcissist, what the hell? How many posts have we seen here where the neurotypical child posts about their parents neglecting them in favour of a special needs child, and are reassured that being neglected just because you are neurotypical is not okay? But here we have the parents' perspective, and suddenly it's fine to focus all the attention on the special needs child. There is a ton that is missing in this post. What is Kevin's behaviour like? Does he have constant meltdowns that have disrupted the neurotypical children's lives and education when they were younger? Were they told when they were in school that they couldn't have extracurriculars because Kevin couldn't be brought along or left alone, and disrupting his routine would make him melt down? What is the origin of all this resentment? It didn't come from nowhere, and it doesn't make the neurotypical children entitled narcissists to wish that they'd had the same opportunities their peers had and resent the source of the neglect the parents who couldn't and wouldn't give the neurotypical children equal time. If Austin had posted here instead of talking about how Kevin has always been their father's 100% focus, and he was put on the back burner and expected to just be okay, without any parental attention, and now he resents his father for this, would your judgement be the same? And Lilu Lei replies, If he was a minor child, I might give this perspective a lot more credence. As it is, he's a goddamn adult whose father is still financially supporting him. He pays no rent and doesn't kick in for groceries, and he needs to act like it. Demanding his father give him $600 a week because his special needs minor child actually requires paid care for that amount is ridiculous, and I honestly wouldn't accept that bullcrap from a minor child either, 
Jesus F in Christ. A lot of food for thought on that one, hey. That gives a very good perspective of the situation, and I, I honestly, you know, kind of thought of it like that, and I didn't think of it like that at the same time. What are your thoughts on this one? Would you put up with it, or what would you do in this situation? Our next post is by user Select Description Thirty Five, titled. Am I the a-hole for excluding my sister slash making her feel bad for not donating blood? So a couple days ago, I got an email about some blood drive going on, and they were asking me to donate. I'm a frequent blood donor, but this time I thought I should ask my family to donate as well. My younger brother and three cousins agreed, but my younger sister, 19 female, said she was scared of needles and didn't want to. I am scared of needles even those smaller ones for your finger, but that fear has nothing to do with the fear of dying in my opinion, but cool. Donating has to be something someone wants to do, so I respect her decision and didn't even push it. Went to the drive, donated, then got back. One of my cousins couldn't because of some pills he'd recently taken for a headache, but everyone else did. When we got back, I was hungry and too lazy to make food, so I opted to go to town and grab some burgers or something in town, as takeaway, and maybe some other stuff for myself and my brother and cousins as a treat for donating. My sister asked where her invitation was, and I said she could come, but I'm not paying for her. She then got pissy, saying that I was being unfair, because I know she couldn't because she's scared. I told her that I have no problem with that, but this was my treat to thank them for donating with me. She brought up my cousin who didn't donate, but he was really enthusiastic and wanted to. Only stopped by the medication, Elsie would have donated as well, so he's included for trying. She's still giving me the silent treatment, and my mum thinks that I was an a-hole for excluding her and making her feel bad. Am I the a-hole? So we've got two people that can or cannot, or will or will not, donate for two separate reasons. I would say that both are legitimate reasons for not donating blood, although the cousin had absolutely no choice to donate blood there. I think she absolutely knows that there is a difference between the medical problems and her being scared of needles here. And I understand at the same time that both OP and her are both wrong for their decisions on this. She shouldn't be expecting free food from OP for this flaw in logic that she's found, and OP shouldn't be giving free food because of that flaw in logic also. OP is choosing a side, and he's going to die on that hill, and she's trying to push her own agenda in this one as well. I'm just going to go with everyone sucks here. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, but pointing it out like this, everyone sucks here. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. They say, I'm conflicted since I paid for my cousin, even though he technically just accompanied us in the end, so by technicality, however, he would literally have filled the form out and was ready to go, so yeah. Aslan Lives On says, Everyone sucks here. She was acting a little entitled, but you were treating everyone and purposely excluding her almost as punishment for being scared about donating. You're the a-hole for making her feel bad about not donating. I'm absolutely terrified of needles to the point of nearly passing out from the fear, and I've still given blood. And OP can decide who they spend their money on. If they want to thank their brother and cousins for donating with them, then that's their choice. Sister didn't donate, so she doesn't get the thanks. Username52 says, You're the a-hole. I'm scared too? You're able to be a frequent donor. I have a friend who would want to give blood, but faints at the sight of a needle, that would mean both not donating blood and causing a way bigger problem for everyone who works there. I went the other day and finally talked my, way older than 19 years old, husband into trying, even though I've been going regularly for years. His temperature was like 0.2 high and he couldn't give, but I was happy he finally tried. It wasn't like you stopped for burgers on the way home. It was like you were punishing your sister for not giving blood, instead of encouraging her to think about it in the future. Also, you should have people look into the questions before they go. No reason for your cousin to have gone if he took aspirin the day before. The first question is, do you feel healthy today? 
Your sister can honestly answer no if she's terrified, heart racing, etc., and not be eligible. You're the a-hole. I worked at a blood bank as one of the people who actually take your blood. School drives are the worst due to the peer pressure. I had a person have the worst reaction I've ever seen while I was doing the intake evaluation, straight up passed out when I did the finger stick. It took hours to get them well enough to move to the facility's on-site nurse. It's a miracle they didn't hit their head on the way down. Oh, and while they were not stable, we couldn't process the usual amount of the potential donors as a bed and a blood bank nurse had to evaluate them frequently. If your sis was scared, bullying her into donating is a disservice. She can be helpful in other ways, organizing another drive, bringing snacks, or just being the person to take you and pick you up. Well, reading further down the comments, it looks like the consensus here is you're the a-hole, and I can definitely see myself swapping to an you're the a-hole agreement for this one. He was being the a-hole in this situation, it does look like, and it just makes sense that it would be counterproductive to get her to even be there to donate blood. It would just waste a lot of people's time, and it wouldn't be fun for anyone. So yeah, I can swap mine to you're the a-hole. Seems like a good idea. Posted by user Triple Troubled Mom, titled Am I the a-hole for not wanting to name my children after someone else's stillborn babies? Throw away because my family uses Reddit, and while they might recognize this, I didn't want it attached to my main account. Also on mobile. My fiancé and I are expecting triplets, and found out they're all boys a month or so ago. His aunt had been pregnant with triplets five years ago, Two boys and a girl. The boys did not survive the entire pregnancy, and she went into early labor. We all felt terrible for her, and most of the family grieved with her. Ever since discovering that I was having triplets, his aunt has been doting on me and telling me all about her triplet pregnancy. It's been overbearing, but I try not to say much because I know it's a sore spot, and she's probably grieving all over again because of my pregnancy, and I do feel a little guilty, even though I haven't done anything, if that makes sense. She's always asking me if I feel movement, and seems worried that I will lose one or two of them. I have had three single pregnancies previously, different father, and my doctor isn't incredibly concerned for my three boys, but does caution that multiples comes with risks. Anyway, me and my fiancé have discussed names several times, and still haven't firmly decided on any. His aunt offered us the names of her two boys, first and middle. They are from the Lord of the Rings and other books that she's read that I've never heard of. And while I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, I just don't like the names. I just kind of shrugged when she offered and said that I'd think about it, and was hoping she'd drop it. But there has been three occasions that she has said something like, How's little Samwise and Dritz doing? Does their brother have a name yet? And at one point... We were discussing other names when she walked in. We were at his grandmother's, her mother, and she asked if we weren't using her names, as if we had actually agreed to before. I finally spoke up and told her that I felt she was getting too attached to my unborn babies. Really, I said, no, we don't like those names, and I feel you're attaching yourself to my unborn children way too much. They aren't your lost twins reborn, and you need to stop acting like it. And while I know that was harsh to say to a grieving mother, regardless of how long it's been, I'm going to excuse myself as a grumpy pregnant woman who is generally non-confrontational. We went home shortly after, and while most of the family is indifferent, some have said that I should have spoken to her nicely and not told her I didn't like her son's names. I've also been told that I should apologize, and one person even suggested using just the middle names. I honestly don't even know how to spell them, or what book series they're from, but they're ridiculous. So, am I the a-hole? And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I believe I am the a-hole because I yelled, spoke strongly, at a grieving mother and told her I didn't like her son's names. Look, I can agree with you on that point there. A lot of the times in these decisions, you know, just yelling at someone and hurting their feelings doesn't particularly make you an asshole for doing that. 
Yes, if you want someone off your back, you can be nice about it. But some people don't take positive reinforcement as a sign to stop doing it. Sometimes, people only stop when you negatively reinforce something. And yes, it's an a-hole thing from the outside to negatively reinforce a point, but sometimes that's what you have to do to get someone just to stop. Because they won't take a positively reinforcing no as an answer. I can understand people giving this one an everyone sucks here judgement, but I'm gonna give this one a not the a-hole judgement, because yeah, he hurt her feelings, and yes, she's grieving, there are good ways and bad ways to go about this one, and I wasn't in the room, but I'm assuming that this situation warranted OP giving this harsh response, saying I'm sorry, but I don't like the names, I understand that you're grieving, it's all good, but please stop. I would sympathize with OP here saying that it's a spur of the moment thing and they've got their own demons to handle. But I also see arguments for everyone sucks here, therefore I agree with people that say that as well and disagree with my judgement. But I'm going with not the a-hole. Do the Pingu says, everyone sucks here. She was intrusive and you were quite harsh. I would have stopped at, please don't name our babies, we are going to name them ourselves. Yeah, definitely everyone sucks here. Just because she's played nice for all these months doesn't give her the right to finally snap. The aunt wasn't receiving any feedback on her actions, so she assumed what she was doing was okay. She had multiple opportunities to correct the behavior appropriately, but didn't act on them. The aunt shouldn't have pushed it so much, obviously because she was stepping over the line, but OP needed to correct it sooner. This. Avoiding dealing with a problem doesn't give you the green light to say hurtful things when you finally snap. Letting something slide the first time it comes up is fine, but you have to deal with it once it becomes an issue, and the more you ignore it, the worse it will be. A simple, those are lovely names, but we want to use something that has meaning for us, with a follow-up of, we haven't changed our minds, we will be using our own names, if needed, would have been far better leaving it to the point where Aunt has deluded herself into believing you'll use the names, and you've lost the plot while having to talk her down from a far worse place, is always going to end badly. Everyone sucks here. Amara Undone says, Everyone sucks here. I was going to go with no one being an a-hole, until I saw what you said to her. Pregnancy hormones aren't an excuse for saying things that are frankly cruel. You've carried three healthy pregnancies to term, you have no idea how she feels or what she's going through. Instead of politely yet firmly telling her you don't want to use the names because they aren't your taste, and or it would make you uncomfortable to do so, you took a bit of a cruel shot at her. However, it sounds like she could use the help of a professional therapist, which would be infinitely more helpful than someone telling her, these aren't your dead sons reborn. Dreddy Fair says, not the a-hole, you're right. She was projecting on your unborn children, and that can move quickly into unhealthy. Sometimes you just have to put and say things to get people to stand down, otherwise they will just keep doing it. Alyssa Hargreave says, Not the a-hole. I get she's grieving again because triplets and all, but that doesn't give her the right to try to treat them as do-overs. Suggesting names is fine, offering the names are fine, but when you're basically demanding that the parents use them, it's over the line. She's implied heavily that you agreed and you haven't. Yes, you were a little harsh, but honestly, I don't see her getting the point any other way until they're born, and she sees the announcement, and then it blows up even larger because she convinced herself that you were using the names. And if you can't even tell people the origin of names, then you shouldn't be forced to use them. And those names though, Samwise is at least, like, passable? Still in shock over here that this woman expected another person to name her kid after Drizzt de Erden. Good fantasy name, horrible name for a real person. Posted by user TA Salary. Titled, Am I the a-hole for telling my boss I don't believe in loyalty and it's unreasonable to expect me to not quit for a better paid job? So I worked at my first job for six years. They trained me from ground zero on everything. I had a great boss, who fought for my promotions, and in those six years, my salary doubled. 
got an offer from a more prestigious company with better growth opportunities and double the salary. Edited, maths are hard. We're talking substantial money, 120k versus 250k. I quit without thinking twice and thought it was more respectful not to ask my boss to use any of his political capital to get me a match. He couldn't. Part of my new comp is stock in the new company and the salary is likely more than his pay. So I simply gave him my notice and explained my transition plan. Boss was truly devastated and very, very angry. We both stayed professional throughout the discussion, but it got heated and he questioned my loyalty as if it's a character flaw. I said my view is I paid him and the company back with my hard work, so we're at the very least even. Arguably, they got a bargain deal because I could have jumped ship for more money two years ago. Should I have handled any of this differently? My wife and some friends say that I'm being rather cold and calculating. I should have shown more loyalty since the company gave me so much. I think it's disrespectful to assume I didn't give them anything less than enough in return. I know my worth and my contribution to the company's bottom line. I've seen people walked out of the door after two decades with a pink slip, and no one shed a tear the morning after. I respect my old boss, but what the hell is loyalty to your job supposed to even mean? You've made a good argument, and I'm convinced that this is a not the a-hole judgment. It seems that yes, he is offended, but if he's not going to be offended and upset at the pink slip treatment, it seems like his loyalties lie to the bottom line of the company and how much money he's making. If it means he can potentially get you back on board, obviously he's going to do every manipulation tactic in the book that he can so he doesn't lose the company money and in turn his own salary. I'm not on board with that boss's manipulation and what he's doing to you. You absolutely are more than welcome to leave the company. He's giving you even more reason to do so. So I can't fault you for that. Not the a-hole. And in the comments, Cadillac Blood says, Not the a-hole. I was ready to say you're an asshole and give you the whole fine line between honesty and rudeness talk. But to be honest, I see absolutely nothing wrong with your course of action. You worked there, you did your thing and got a better offer. Let the boss know. When the boss asked why, you explained it to him. There isn't much reason for him to be mad, except he got frustrated that you have more than two brain cells. Loyalty to the company doesn't mean you should turn down good career opportunities. It means not spreading, I don't know, company secrets or talking crap about your workplace and stuff. Between skill replies, company loyalty is a one-way street. Your employer only cares about it as long as it benefits them. In 99% of professional jobs, no company would hold your hand and sacrifice for the employee if they were struggling and hurting the team. It's basically just yet another way capital owners try to keep workers from making things difficult for them. Loyalty to your employer in our modern economy sounds like such a futile idea. Growing up, my dad worked for a pretty big company for about 20 years, but he got sick when I was in high school and was put on permanent disability. He passed about 15 years later, and when going through his affairs, I couldn't find his life insurance policy. I called HR at the previous company to see if it was possibly the same policy he had when he worked there. Turns out, it was because the company continued to pay for all of his insurance benefits and a few other things, even though he hadn't worked there in almost 15 years. A couple hours later, I got a call back from the CEO expressing his condolences. Apparently, he called my dad a few times a year to check on him. Not only that, he knew where I went to college, that I was a teacher, my husband's name, and that I was living out of state. This man had thousands of employees, and yet he was so good to my dad. A man who hadn't worked for his company in 15 years. He and his company are definitely part of that 1%. Yeah, that is great to hear. Just sad that it's always the exception and not the rule. Loudend2 says, Not the a-hole. I've seen people walked out of the door after two decades with a pink slip. Yep, and your boss would have happily done this with you as well. You're talking about more than doubling your salary, and you usually only get that type of bump when you switch employers. My take is... If they wanted to keep you, they should have kept your salary competitive the whole time. 
I hope you did your due diligence, though. More money doesn't make it a better place to work. And OP replies, Thanks. In all fairness, I know for a fact my old boss would have fought for me, but agreed that if it was between him and me, for example, I'm the one walking out of the door. So I take the same approach. I'll put my family and our financial stability over him every day. The opportunity was too good to pass on either way. I'm fortunate to like my new team, but I was offered a job with a fang of my profession, so even if I need to be absolutely miserable here for two years and then jump, it's worth it to pad the resume. Don't think I'll need to do the jump though. And Faye Piper says, Not the a-hole. I do think that you could have handled it better, just because this could bite you if you need to get a reference or something happens with your new job, this was one of those, you're right, but you shouldn't say it, situations. At the same time, that's only a pragmatic consideration, and from a manners standpoint, you were fine. This is just old boomer mentality on your old boss's part. And OP replies, thank you. Can I ask you a blunt question, this being the internet at all? Do you see a way to handle it better without being disingenuous? I come from a very blunt culture, Russia, and had pretty honest communication with my boss. When I am asked, aren't you being disloyal, my first instinct is to directly answer the question as asked. I'm fine if it's viewed as rude or cold in the eyes of an American. Just curious if there's a middle ground that I'm not thinking of that would allow me to stay true to my character without hurting feelings. I think this may be an American thing, possibly just a year old boss thing, because you would absolutely not be asked this question by anyone I've worked for in the UK. Employers should expect you to look out for yourself. Loyalty to the company is ridiculous. They certainly wouldn't be loyal to you if it stopped suiting them. People have suggested making him aware you were looking would have been a good plan, but that could have put you at risk of being fired for a petty reason just because of his strange attitude. You need to look out for yourself when it comes to your employment. Obviously be a good employee, but turning down double your salary would be ludicrous. Not the a-hole. Ha, huh. I saw you mention the UK and thought this was going to be a totally different direction. I sometimes wanted to pull my hair out when reading project requests from our UK colleagues. Email the length of a 10-page memo, and they never get to directly telling you what they want from you. Culture clash at its best. I can't imagine them asking a direct question such as, where's your loyalty in the first place to be honest? Thanks for your contribution. And now, update. Probably a bit mundane, but some folks wanted an update. Took my old boss out for a beer to not burn that bridge as some of you have suggested. We sat in an outside pub garden for all the health conscious Redditors. Both had a great time. A couple months helped us cool off and getting together turned into a lot of reminiscing about the good old times together. It also got us talking, even more frankly, about the things that would be viewed too political if we were still employed by the same company. I think I may have kept my mentor in my life after all. I apologised for perhaps ending things with my old job too abruptly, and he said I couldn't have left at a worse time, but then again... There was no better or worse time to lose me, and to not sweat it. He says he understands why I took the job, respects my reasoning for trying to protect him from using up the goodwill that he built to save me as an employee and get me a match, and that giving him an earlier heads up might have given him more time to find a replacement, but that didn't make a huge difference at the end of the day. It's all water under the bridge now. The company already hired my replacement for about 25% more than I was paid. He didn't disclose the exact amount, but that was the implication. He was blunt I wouldn't have gotten that much, even with the offer I had. He also said his priorities in life are very different, and he's happy where he is due to personal reasons and work-life perks, but that I need to seek what is the right answer for me. Said he's happy to work with me again if an opportunity presents itself and I echoed that sentiment. Who knows, we may end up on the same team one way or another. A few things I took away from the Reddit discussion and our talk with the old boss. Look out for yourself. Your company is not the same thing as your boss. There are structural obstacles to fight against, and because you're loyal to one person doesn't mean the company as a whole feels that way about you. 
I don't regret my choice. Be good to people who are good to you and do right by them. If that doesn't go against number one. I wasn't a dick in my final interview and thanked my old boss profusely. It made a difference, but obviously he was still upset in the moment, which leads me to number three. People are people. They are imperfect and have lapses of judgment. If you see them as such, you will find it easier to move on and move up in your professional life. Good luck, you all, and thanks again for your input. Sometimes consulting Reddit does put a good spin on a trivial story. And in the comments, Merk Meister says, Why do employers hire replacements and pay them way more than the original employee? That just makes no sense. Bluntly put, two different policies, retention raises and talent acquisition budgets. For the retention pool of cash, HR will fight harder to not give people already hired a higher raise. There's an understanding, justified one by the way, that people will be happier with less and won't leave if they're already employed. For talent acquisition, the market dictates the salary. People ask for a premium to take on the risk of changing jobs. Thus, the company has no choice but to pay it or go without an employee. Which is why I often mentor young people, you must be willing to leave to get what you are worth. You may be able to come back in the future at a higher pay grade, but all too often it's nearly impossible to actually get what you're worth while staying. This is especially true when you are brought in at a super low rate. Haggis Hunter 91 says, my boss actively encourages everyone under him to at least go to one job interview every year. We'll even give time off to attend them, even if it's not a position in the same company. His reasoning is that it encourages people to think about whether they really want to be there. Seems counterintuitive, but his staff retention rate is the best in the company. Must be a confident guy in that this company must be a confident guy in that his company provides competitive salaries and good work environments. I'm sure this only works if you're a top-notch employer in both of those areas. People may not want to leave Google corporate, but won't feel the same way about an Amazon warehouse job. Posted by user, Am I the A-hole throw away cat door? Titled, Am I the A-hole for opening my roommate's door while she slept? throw away because my reddit username is linked to me all over the internet. I promise the story isn't anywhere near as creepy as the title. So I, 22 female, have lived with my housemate Jane, 24 female, for about 5 months now. We get on pretty well, we cook together sometimes, only have minor house disagreements that usually get sorted really quickly, which makes me think that I've made a huge mistake here. We both own a cat each. They coexist happily, and the cats will sleep with either of us depending on their mood. But lately her cat, let's call her Fluffy, has only been sleeping in Jane's room, which is usually fine. The issue is that when Jane closes her bedroom door and Fluffy can't get in, Fluffy will meow and scratch at the door until she gets let in. She does this for hours. No, I am not exaggerating. She may take a small break for 5 minutes, but will go straight back to meowing and scratching. When I first brought this up to Jane, as our rooms are quite close, she just laughed it off and said that she's so used to it, she just sleeps through it, and she only closes her door to keep Fluffy out when she's being annoying and disrupting her sleep. She told me it doesn't happen that often, and I'll also get used to it. It's been happening every night for the past 2 weeks. I cannot sleep through it, and I'm woken up and kept up multiple times a night because of the constant meowing and scratching. I brought it up with Jane again, who just shrugged and said to ignore it. Last night was the last straw for me. I had to get up super early for an important work meeting and was already feeling unwell. So when Fluffy started meowing at 3.30 in the morning, I was at my last nerve and just opened Jane's door to let her into the bedroom. This morning, Jane stormed into my room and demanded to know why I breached her privacy by opening the door while she was sleeping, and that it was weird and creepy. I tried to explain that Fluffy was keeping me awake, but she said it was no excuse, and I had to get some earplugs or something, but that I violated her privacy, and it was not okay at all, and that I was an a-hole. I think she's being a tiny bit ridiculous. 
I didn't peep in or anything. I literally just pushed the door open and also Fluffy is her cat. I just feel like it's inconsiderate that I have to lose sleep so hers isn't disrupted. But also a couple of my friends did say that it was weird that I opened her bedroom door. So Reddit, am I the a-hole? I feel like she knows she's in the wrong for doing this to you, but she's trying to strong arm you into a decision which is ultimately screwing you over. And losing sleep over something like this, or just losing sleep in general, is in my opinion, one of the worst inconveniences you can have when cohabiting a place with someone. A solution to this could have been, she just leaves her door open and the cat comes in and out. I can understand the privacy aspect, you could always get a cat door in the door, replace the door with a cat door. So many different things that she could have done, but she chooses not to because she's trying to be an asshole. OP was kind of forced into this one, and I'd say that the lack of sleep is a good excuse for doing that. So I'm going to give OP a pass and say, not the a-hole. Stress Relief 375 says, Not the a-hole. What kind of wacko is okay with their cat crying at their door all night long? And OP replies, She's a heavy sleeper when it comes to sounds. I do understand why she keeps Fluffy out sometimes because she loves to climb around your head and knock things over. My cat does the same, but I just deal with it when he does it. You shouldn't have to pick up Fluffy's owner's slack just because you're more willing to tolerate it than Jane is. You deserve peaceful sleep too. She's acting like she's the only one who needs it. For a lark, Niney says, Not the a-hole, and she's being a bad roommate by laughing off the noise the cat is making at night. Instead of you getting earplugs, maybe she should put a cat entrance flap in her door and replace it when she moves out. You weren't being creepy at all. And if she doesn't get that, there's something wrong with her. And Bunch of Bunches says, Not the a-hole. Your roomie is gaslighting you. She's dismissive when it comes to your sleep. A fundamental pillar of physical and mental health. That goes under the shamelessly disrespectful category in my book. She's shown her true colours here, I'm afraid. That's what I was thinking. First five months sounded okay, but this is probably not a spontaneous slip-up. Rumi is likely going to behave like this a hundred times more in the next two to three months. And OP replies, Honestly, it's so weird. I've never gotten an off vibe from her in any way for the past five months, and that's why I'm wondering if I'm an a-hole. To me, it seems like such a tiny thing, but to her it's like the world's ending, and I've never seen her this upset. And Mary Pies 78 says, No a-holes here. Your roommate's kind of right, you shouldn't have opened the door. You would probably be upset too if the roles were reversed. I would apologise and tell her it won't happen again. Next time, don't open her door. Just respect her privacy and pound on her door until she comes and lets the cat in herself. She'll appreciate you not opening her door again, right? When she complains, Ask her how else should the problem be resolved. And OP replies, I personally would not care if she did that to me, but I know everyone has different boundaries. But pounding on the door is a great way to respect her boundaries. You aren't opening the door, you're simply doing what her cat is doing to you, interrupting sleep at all hours of the night. The problem should be fixed shortly thereafter. And now on to the update. So, my original post didn't get that much attention, but things took quite a bit of a weird turn, so I just wanted to update. The only reason I thought I may have been the a-hole was because a few mutual friends of ours said that I was, and when I spoke to my closest friend about it, also friends with Jane, she said I was an a-hole, but it wasn't my fault, and I should just talk to Jane. I felt like I was in crazy town, but texted Jane so that we could talk the day after that I had made the post, and it turns out the issue wasn't the cat at all. I sat her down and told her that I was sorry for opening her door, and I'd never want to make her uncomfortable, but that Fluffy was her cat, not mine, and there was no way I was going to continue to be kept awake, and my sleep was important too, and frankly, she was being selfish. And to my surprise, she just burst into tears? I immediately reached out my hand to comfort her, and she snatched it away. She eventually calmed down and managed to tell me what was happening. 
Basically, she has feelings for me, and thanks to all the fun Reddit relationship stories about housemates and roommates suddenly falling in love over quarantine, she was awake when she heard her door open, and she thought it was me coming in to confess feelings towards her, or for a cuddle or something? I honestly didn't know how to react. It was so bizarre, and I felt so blindsided. The reason why my friends were telling me that I was the a-hole was because they all knew how Jane was feeling. I had to gently tell her that I was very straight, and I didn't reciprocate the feelings, but I appreciated her honesty and her friendship, and I hoped that we could move forward. This didn't go well. Jane ran into her room and immediately locked the door. I had no idea what was happening for the next week or so until I came home one day from work and everything of Jane's was cleared out. She left me a note saying she'd paid me out for the rest of the year, but she couldn't handle being in a house with me and thanked me for being a good stepmom to Fluffy. I'm pretty devastated, honestly. I think Barry, my cat, notices that things are weird and hasn't left my side. I'm upset it had to end this way as I did appreciate her friendship, and I feel bad that I hurt her. So I guess I'll be trying to make the best of having my own space until my lease is ended. Thanks for all the advice in the first post, everyone. Just wish it had a better ending. Posted by user E1145191 Titled Am I the a-hole for firing my son? Throw away because I don't want this scene on my main account. I'll get straight to the issue. My, male 43, 17-year-old son Adam has been trying to become independent and preparing to move to college, but was struggling to find a job. I own a private warehouse as a side job to earn a living. My wife suggested I hire my son to work at the warehouse, moving boxes, bringing workers lunch, helping with cleaning, and that kind of stuff. She said it's for both of our benefits since he couldn't find a job and we needed to hire someone new. I agreed, and Adam was so happy and excited to start working. We agreed on the salary and work hours, so he still has time to study and practice. The first couple of weeks were going fine. That is until one day. The workers were moving boxes, computers, into the warehouse. The client wanted them to be stored for a few days, and we already arranged before they arrived. It was all written down, including the number of computers we stored. In the evening, while I was checking, I noticed there was one computer missing. I gathered all of the workers except for Adam, and they had no idea, and thought there was a mistake. I brought it up at home, and Adam told me that he saw one of the workers putting a box in the garage to take home with him. I was confused, since he couldn't specify which worker it was. He eventually gave me a name, and I went to talk to the worker. He denied it, and I ended up giving him X time to bring back the box, and then I discuss why he did what he did. The worker is a single dad with three kids. I've known him for a while, and I want to give him a chance. So the next day I was busy, and my daughter was in the hospital, and I got back to the warehouse at 8pm, and it occurred to me to check the cameras. What I saw was Adam putting a box in the back of his friend's car, and then the car left. I knew his friend and knew Adam stole the computer. I went home and I confronted him. My wife sided with him when he denied it, and after arguing for hours, I fired him and told him he was lucky I didn't call the police. This was my responsibility. The client entrusted me with his computers, and Adam stole on the job. Adam started crying. My wife said I was wrong for firing him, that it was extreme, and I should have just took from his salary. She refused to drop it and tried to convince me to hire him again, but I refused. I apologized to my worker, and I told him if there's anyone he knows who needs this job, I'll be more than happy to hire them. He brought his brother, and he started working with us right away. Now my family is calling me an a-hole for hiring an outsider, and not my son. Edit to add, the box was being kept at his friend's place. His friend is such a disrespectful a-hole, I wouldn't be surprised if he was the one who came up with the idea. However, it was Adam who took it, and so he needed to be fired. This is not okay, nor is it acceptable. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. 
the minute I started thinking that I'm an a-hole was when my family said that I shouldn't have hired an outsider and left my son jobless. I feel like your son is lying to your family there, and that there's nothing wrong with hiring an outsider, and your son being jobless is his own fault. I can see why, when you have family pressure and people in your face yelling at you, why you would think that you're an a-hole in this instance, because if they're all angry at me and they know the full situation, then obviously there's something I'm not seeing and I've got to be the problem here. But rest assured, these uh, armchair Redditors have got you, and in my opinion, you're not the a-hole for this one. Don't know what's tickling the brain of these people to think that the son is in the right in this situation, but everything you've presented me so far has proven to me that you're pretty in the clear, buddy. There was a good decision to fire him, make an example of him, call the cops if you want to. He deserves it, and you're not the a-hole. Check34 says, Wow. Not the a-hole in this instance, but your family is terrible. Adam happily threw someone he viewed as a worker, and not a single father of three, under the bus for his crime. Turn your son into the cops. He's going to hurt more people if you don't. I would have voted everyone sucks here, but we're talking about the one instance, and not your parenting in general. It's unlikely, however, that you're completely blameless for your son's behaviour. Your family sounds awful, and you had a hand in creating that. Edit. Based on OP's new information, stop. This is not about your son's friend being such a disrespectful a-hole, who you think probably came up with the idea. Even though you acknowledge that your son deserves to be fired for his actions, that overall thought process is enabling your son. And edit two, a lot of people have mentioned that bringing in law enforcement should not be taken lightly. Thank you for your insights. You've given me a lot to think about. I've left the comment as is and look forward to further discussion. I do firmly believe that OP's son needs stronger consequences, but agree that an arrest could do a great deal of harm. Tall Potato 17 replies, 100% agree with you. In my opinion, it doesn't matter if he's his son. He's his employee and committed theft, that's a crime and should be reported to the authorities. And I'm so hungry dude replies, I also agree but I would say everyone sucks here. OP seems to be on the right track with punishing his son by firing him, but what kind of business doesn't check his cameras first before going after an honest worker who happens to be a single father to three children? If it weren't for those cameras, there might have been an innocent family on the streets because your son stole a computer. The reason OP is crappy is although he fired his son, he seems to not want to place the blame on him and is putting the majority, if not all the blame, on the son's friend. The son's friend is not a mind reader and didn't telepathically find out you had computers in the warehouse. Your son had to tell him that and get everything set up first. My bet is the son is asking his friend to hold onto the computer until you forget about it and then pretend he bought one in the future. He was literally going for the perfect crime, and if it wasn't for that meddling camera, he would have gotten away with it too. Zoink, Scoobs. And even with video evidence, OP is still blaming the son's friend? You're setting up your son to be a failure in life if you don't hold him accountable for his actions. If you're going to hire him as an employee, have him face consequences as an employee. He doesn't get to switch to being your employee, and then being your son when it's convenient. That's a slap in the face to your loyal employees. Everyone sucks here. Tall Potato 17 replies, I think the most important thing was that he realized that he made a mistake and apologized to the other worker. After reading this, he should have pressed charges since he's a minor. At most, I think he'll get community service if he hasn't had any trouble with the law, but that should scare any attempts of crime in the future. The Devil's Advocate replies, I do think that's important and a good sign, but not most important. Most important is he's not holding his son fully responsible and even now is telling himself it was the other boy's fault. His wife is a problem too. She's not helping her son. She's helping him evade responsibility. And KL says, Big not the a-hole. This is a serious offence, and if this happened with another boss, he might be sitting in a police office right now. You're a good boss. 
I suggest showing your wife the video if she's taking his side. And OP replies, I can't imagine, but the police would have absolutely gotten involved if this was someone else and not me. I'm not tolerating his behavior. I know what he did was wrong, but I wanted to give him a warning to realize his mistake and learn from it. Nirvana Chaser replies, Obviously you are not the a-hole, but with respect, the willingness to let someone else lose their job and go to prison, in extremis, with all the family disruption that it entails so casually, is a way bigger thing to deal with. Not to suggest that the theft is not also extremely serious. I'd show your wife the tape to shut down that ridiculousness about not believing you, and then deal with both. Edit. You could use the effect that this could have had on your employee to press home how big a deal this is. And edit two. It doesn't matter if his friend is a disrespectful a-hole. Don't let that deflect you here. It's natural to want to blame anyone but your kid, but it won't help him in the long term, and he's still responsible for his actions. Posted by user throwawaywife72. Titled, Am I the a-hole for walking out on husband and babies? Throwaway, and title sounds awful, and I'm 35 female. Probably the a-hole, but my god I am exhausted. So, I'm a stay-at-home mum to my daughter, two, and son, four months. I'm a preschool teacher, and it didn't make sense to go back to work with the cost of childcare and the pandemic risk. My husband works and makes enough to support us, and all my salary would end up going to childcare. We have separate accounts, his idea, and a joint household account that he puts money into. I contributed to this account when I was working. He works from home, a 9 to 5 desk job that isn't stressful. He admits it's a cupcake job. He has weekends and nights off and takes vacation days. He likes his co-workers and often I hear him joking around on calls to them. I love that he loves his job. The problem is that once he's done working, he's done with everything. He'll occasionally play with the kids or fix himself a sandwich, but otherwise he's playing games or reading or watching something. He works out as well in the home gym, but there's nothing pressing on his time. Meanwhile, I cook, clean, make toddlers special diet, no dairy or gluten due to his allergies, I breastfeed on demand, walk and train the dog, love them but he's a Burmese mountain dog and poops like a grown man, as well as do all the upkeep and shopping that comes with running a house. I am just tired. I'm so tired. And when I ask for help, he just stares at me blankly until I go away. Yesterday, I snapped. The kids were crying, the dog crapped on the rug, he's a puppy, and he's reading his tablet and tells me, babe, it smells in here. I made sure there was pumped breast milk and clean bottles, that dog food was out and the toddler had enough food for a few days, and I just left. I haven't picked up the phone, just to text him when they need to eat and the bedtime schedule, and I just realized he has no idea how to keep the kids alive. I want to send my mum over, but I feel like that's rewarding him. I don't know. I got a hotel room for two days, I took a bath, I read a book, and watched Netflix, and honestly, I don't want to go back. I miss the kiddos a ton and the dog, but I don't miss him. His family is calling me non-stop, telling me I'm a bad wife and mum, and his mother is flying in from Florida since I'm having some sort of breakdown. I don't want her here, but I don't know what to do. I'm just so tired. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole, saying... I might be the a-hole because I left my two young children with my husband who has no idea what to do with them and that this is probably scary for them. Some people might call this an everyone sucks here one, but I see this as someone that's at the end of their tether that's also having to deal with all the drama and pandemonium of the world that we're in right now. And all of that, plus running the household and having no help from him, having no communication from him, and just having a blank stare until she goes away? That's not healthy, and that's not conducive to a good relationship. This seems like it's something that's been a long time coming, he should have seen this coming, he should have prepared and done something to change his ways, and yet he hasn't. Life doesn't work like that. 
You don't become a cater for every one person when you're a stay-at-home mum. There's still a marriage, there's still a relationship, there's still kids to feed and look after, there's still a dog that needs to be looked after, and if you sign off on everything after work and you never take responsibility, you deserve to be walked out on. Yes, the way she's done it is sloppy here, but sometimes this is the only way for someone to have a wake-up call. I can definitely understand if there's a small percentage of people that think it's an everyone sucks here for her doing that, but I would disagree. So my judgement for this one is a not the a-hole judgement. In the comments, Thea M says, Not the a-hole, honey, and I say this with love, you do sound like you're in the middle of a breakdown. There is no shame in that. Take care of you, take that bath, make sure someone knows you are okay. Take the time you need. When you do go home, you've got to have an honest conversation with your husband that he needs to step up. Maybe go to couples counselling so someone outside of this can help him hear you. But you take care of you right now. I know I'm a random stranger, but I'm sending you so many hugs. And OP replies, Thank you so much. I'm calling a therapist on Monday to schedule something. I'm normally a really go-with-the-flow person, but it's just been endless. You sound overwhelmed and exhausted. I know this may be inappropriate, but I lit a candle for you, and I'm so on your side. You take care of yourself. I don't think that's inappropriate at all. I think that's rather sweet. I've been close to OP's situation, and having someone to just listen to me would have been so nice and validating. OP, you were definitely not the a-hole. But like this one said above, you absolutely are going to have to have an honest conversation. I do hope you are able to get in to see someone, and I'm also sending love, hugs, and every good vibe I can your way. Diavolo's thought says, Not the a-hole, but I do feel the need to say something. You need to sit down with your husband and have a serious conversation about working as a team. Those are his kids too, and he needs to take care of them, shake my head. Parenting classes and couples counselling should also be an option. Honestly, he sounds like a deadbeat though, as a father at least, and you should probably leave for good. He is a deadbeat dad. You both have full-time jobs, being a full-time mom is a full-time job, and when you both are home, he needs to be able to contribute somehow. I feel extremely sorry for OP, and I have no idea why she would want to continue this marriage. Our next post is by user, beginning ad 3472, titled, Am I the a-hole for lying to my cat? Oh god, this is stupid, but I was told to ask others for their opinion, so here I am. My, 23 female, girlfriend, 19 female, claims I suck for lying to my cat, 2 male. I don't like my cat roaming around the kitchen when I'm not there, just because he might get his less than average intelligence paws on something that he shouldn't. So I gotta get him out of there when I leave. On a small shelf next to the door, I keep a tiny bag of kitty treats, and sometimes when he refuses to come when I call his name, I shake the little bag to get him out and close the door behind him. Enter the problem. I don't actually give him a treat every time I do this. Sometimes I just pick him up and give him a big old smooch. Sometimes he gets a treat. My girlfriend thinks this counts as being mean to my cat because he might be expecting a sweet little treat and that disappointing him is cruel. This isn't a serious fight, just something that sometimes comes up when I don't give him treats. It isn't creating problems between us, but this time she said, ask literally anyone else and see if they think you're being fair. So, we'll be reading the responses together. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I could be an ass because I'm not taking my girlfriend's claim seriously. I think she's silly, but I should probably at least hear her out. I think it's fair enough that you would feel like an a-hole for not taking their claims, concerns, and worries seriously. That's absolutely understandable. But in this case, I don't think it's as bad as they claim it to be. I think she's overthinking this situation, and it's not as deep as she claims to be. I don't think the cat has particularly human-like feelings about this thing. 
I think it's responding to a reward offer, and it's getting that reward. And even if that reward is cuddles, kisses, and attention, I think the cat doesn't mind as much. I'm sure this one goes by a cat-by-cat -cat basis, but I don't think the cat thinks you're an asshole for not giving it a treat every time. So for that one, I'm just going to go with not the a-hole. In the comments, Floppy Eared Dog says, You're the a-hole. Yours sincerely, your cat. <laughs> we love to see it. Psalm 1267 says, It's called operant conditioning using intermittent reinforcement, and it's the most effective way to change behavior and make it persistent. I personally think it sucks, especially since that's what social media is doing to us to keep us addicted to it. I always valued a trusting relationship with my cats, and even let them know ahead of time whenever they had to go to the vet. Wow, wasn't actually expecting anything this insightful. Thank you for taking the time to defend into my cat so scientifically. I think there might be another downside to this thing. Because your cat could come to the conclusion that he gets a treat when he goes into the kitchen, so maybe he should do it more often. But no a-holes here. This whole thing is just so funny, and I love seeing just wholesome posts in this sub for a change, so thanks for sharing. This was my mistake. I have a screened-in porch, so I let the cats out there when the weather is nice. I started giving them treats to lure them inside, and now, whether I have treats or not, they run out onto the porch whenever they think I might close the door, and then they wait on the doorstep and watch me. The older one actually looked from me to the cabinet where I keep the treats, and back. So, now I only give them treats rarely. But I make sure to praise them every time they come in when called, and I make more of a point to praise the oldest cat, who is too old to engage in such manipulative behaviour. And Chew My Fudge says, Not the a-hole. What you're doing is fine, as long as he's healthy, eats and drinks enough. There's no harm in fooling him a little. Suggestion? Get a red laser pointer and use that instead to lure him out if it helps your moral compass. My cat at least couldn't ignore it, trying to catch that damn thing like her life depended on it. Edit? Apparently lasers are bad for fooling an animal with what they can't catch? Oh well. And OP replies, Unfortunately the cat is half blind and doesn't exactly vibe with visual toys. But I could try to lure him out with one of his squeakies. That's really good advice. Posted by user WrongWayDo8879. Titled, Am I the a-hole for not caring about my ex or her kid? So I was with my ex for 12 years, married for 8 of those. I thought we had a great relationship. However, that was proven to be a lie when I found out our child wasn't actually mine. The child was a little under one year old when I found out. The little girl was diagnosed with an inherited genetic disease that my wife nor I had, so after a genetic test, I was told I wasn't the father. I left her almost immediately and wished her the best with her life and hoped her daughter would do well. During the beginning of the divorce, I was served with a summons for a child support case. My lawyer told me since I acted as the father for a fair amount of time, I shouldn't be shocked if I'm ordered to pay. I wanted to fight, but I wasn't worried. I had a good backup plan. Long story short, the real father wasn't found, and I was ordered to pay. She smiled pretty big after the hearing, and I was upset, admittedly, so I told her that I'd send her a check before garnishment kicked in. I liquidated all of my assets pretty quickly, took a loss on some things, but hey, I'm still young. Called my parents, and they got my room ready, and I moved back home, in my home country. I sent my ex a picture of me smiling back home, and told her best of luck. I've gotten a few calls and letters regarding the support, but they get blocked or tossed in the trash. I don't think I'm the a-hole here. I didn't cheat, and she's not my child's. Some people argue about the bond, but I can't say I had a strong one, considering I was ready to walk the second I heard about what was up. So Reddit, am I the a-hole? And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I guess some people think I'm the a-hole because I walked away so easily. Oh my god, that's some king shit right there, what the hell? Congratulations for doing what a lot of people don't manage to do, that's what I've got to say. 
You didn't walk out on your wife and child. She cheated on you and she managed to weasel her way into getting child support off you too. I really can't fault you for this one. I think that's some huge cojones you got on you and I really respect you liquidating all your assets, immediately moving on and jumping shit back to your home country. That may be morally questionable to some people, but that's not your kid, not your circus, not your monkeys. Why should you have to deal with that? She's the one who cheated, there shouldn't be repercussions for you. So no, not the a-hole. Sid the horror kid says, Not the a-hole. I'm honestly amazed by all the you're the a-hole ratings that you're getting. She knew damn well the kid wasn't yours, and still had the audacity to go to court for child support. Good on you for leaving behind all that BS, completely cut him out and move on with your life. She made her bed with her actions and lies. She can now lie in it. You are in no way obligated to pay up for a kid that's not yours. I doubt anyone in your position would have still stuck around. I wish you luck on a new happy life, OP. I'm not surprised, honestly. I understand where some of them are coming from, with the arguments that the child is being financially screwed over. But I've never agreed that anyone should be required to pay for a child that is not theirs. I honestly believe that if the situation comes to pass, that the mother knew about that and willingly deceived the father into thinking a child was theirs for financial gain, then there should be criminal penalty. Trophy Horse says, Considering how young the child was when you found out, I'm going to say not the a-hole. She won't even remember you. Lucky for you, you found out so soon on. What the hell is up with the system that will order you to pay child support on a kid that isn't yours that you've only been raising for about a year, though? They don't want the mum getting snap, I guess. I'm not sure what snap is, but F that system, honestly. It's food stamps and medical cards, no doubt. And Love Giving Advice says... Not the a-hole, because I don't agree with a system that allows someone to be liable after being lied to. I would commend you if you were still there for an innocent child, but I think this system is unfair. Women who do this should be charged with fraud. Not so sure about fraud, but okay. Posted by user car12269. Titled... Am I the a-hole for ordering pizza to my boyfriend's parents' house when they threw me a birthday dinner party with no food that I could eat? I am stuck in a different state than my family and friends right now due to the virus. So on my birthday, my boyfriend and parents were going to throw me a small party. Just me, my boyfriend, and his little siblings, and his parents. A super low-key dinner. I'm vegetarian. I have been for 13 years. It's not anything new or anything that people don't know. So when I went to their house and saw them cooking pasta with bacon pieces and cooking up veggies in the bacon grease pan, I realized there was nothing I could have except beer and I was hungry. I reminded them I don't eat meat and they were like, you can pick the bacon bits out, they're just sprinkled on top and give them to your boyfriend, he'll eat anything. And we made vegetables that you can eat too. I didn't want to pick meat out of the pasta or eat vegetables that were cooked in bacon fat, so I said I wasn't sure. I didn't like meat flavour at all. I might have something else. They said there was hardly any bacon grease in the pan. While they'd used it for bacon, they just didn't wash in between, but I wouldn't even taste it. Then I ordered a pizza to their house, and when it arrived, his parents were mad and upset that I had. I said that I mentioned that I wasn't into eating meat, so I might get my own food. My boyfriend and I left early, and went out ice skating, so the day turned out fine, lol. Am I the a-hole for ordering pizza? I feel like the family is probably just ignorant of the fact that cooking stuff in bacon grease makes it not a vegetarian option. So, you know, I can fault them on that one for their ignorance, but at the same time it's understandable that they didn't understand, if you understand what I'm trying to put down. Sure, it could come across as a bit rude, from you just ordering pizza while there's perfectly good food available for you and offered to you, but the fact is you made it clear that you couldn't eat it and that you wouldn't eat it and they didn't give you a reasonable alternative that fits in your dietary guidelines. 
perfectly permissible for you to order your own food, get your own pizza. Too bad, so sad that they're gonna get upset at that. It doesn't make you an a-hole for doing it. It makes them kind of dickish in my mind for not giving you a reasonable alternative. So in this situation, in this universe, you are not the a-hole. Maybe in a parallel universe, something different happens. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I ordered pizza to my birthday dinner party because they didn't cook vegetarian dinner. I completely glossed over the fact it was a birthday dinner party. That makes it even more egregious on their side. They suck. They, they suck. There's no explanation for it. The parallel universe, they dive even deeper into this sucky hole. These people are basically vacuum cleaners at this point. Hole P1870 says, Not the a-hole in my opinion. What else were you supposed to do? Starve? I guess they thought I'd be fine to serve myself pasta and just pick around the bacon pieces when serving. And I think they thought I wouldn't care about eating vegetable that had been cooked in the same pan as the bacon without washing. Apparently, since it's a treated cast iron pan, they never wash it with soap, lol. Why is that a lol? Cleaning a cast iron pan involves scrubbing it with salt, then rinsing it with hot water, then treating it with a little bit of oil so it doesn't rust. They could just cook it in a pan that isn't cast iron for that purpose. I know plenty of people with cast iron, but I don't know a single person who only has cast iron cookware. Not the a-hole. If this party was supposed to be for you, I don't know why asking you what you wanted wasn't the first order of business. But even if they couldn't be bothered to do that, who makes the guest of honor a dish that's focused on the flavor of an ingredient they can't eat? That's exactly my thought. They invited her over for her birthday and didn't even ask what she wanted? I remember the first time my parents cooked for my now wife. My mom asked if what she was making was okay. She's not even a vegetarian, but my mom still made sure everything would be okay. Also, my sister-in-law doesn't eat pork, and we easily plan around that. It's not that hard to plan around someone's dietary needs. They can always just make meat on the side for everyone else. Not the a-hole. As someone who has gone back and forth between strict vegetarianism for a few years and back to eating meat again, I can tell you that there's a good chance that bacon grease would have done a number on your stomach. I still don't eat a lot of meat, but I try to have it every now and then, just so I don't have to go through that terrible reintroduction process again. After 13 years, I'm guessing the bacon grease would have been really foreign to your digestive system. Even if it wouldn't, so what? This would have been rude in any circumstance, doubly so when the celebration is nominally for her. My sister hates mushrooms. It's a preference, sure, but she hates them. For her last birthday we celebrated, I made a butternut squash risotto as a side dish. I would have been a real tramp if I made a mushroom risotto instead, knowing how much the birthday girl hates mushrooms. Our next post is by user, Kittens on my lap, titled, Am I the a-hole for blowing up at my boyfriend just because he was ignorant? His words. I'll try to keep this short. I, 19 female, slept over at my boyfriend's, 23 male, place, and I unexpectedly got my period during the night, a regular cycle. He freaked out, I was embarrassed and offered to wash the sheets. He wasn't having any of it and basically told me I must be irresponsible and disgusting, yelling the whole time. At that point, I got annoyed too and told him he was acting like a real a-hole. I went to take a quick shower and was about to go home when he stopped me to continue the argument. I explained to him that I can't control when they happen, that they can be irregular as hell and that they're not that gross. He was talking about throwing away the sheets, and the stain wasn't even that big, and I put them in the washer before I showered. He told me that he didn't know those things, and that I'm unreasonable for being mad at him for just a misunderstanding, and that he couldn't have known since they didn't teach him that in school. Obviously, I'm not mad at him for not knowing, I'm mad at him for assuming he knew better, and reacting by yelling at me. He's mad because I'm mad, and he thinks that I can't be mad about ignorance, since it's not his fault. I apologized for calling him an a-hole, but he doesn't want to apologize for yelling. 
Am I the a-hole? I only want him to apologize for yelling. OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. Because I called him an asshole and don't want to make up yet. I think this is one of those small crossroads in a relationship where it's genuinely a questionable time to be like, is this something I hold on to and make a point of? Or am I being a bit too overly dramatic? Or are they the problem? It's sometimes good to bring these to third parties because having an unbiased outsider's perspective can give you, or not give you, the advice that you need. I would say in this situation, I'm kind of on your side for it. Yes, he's ignorant of the processes that go on in the human body, and that these things happen, but I don't think that him not apologizing for it is the hill that he wants to die on. That kind of sucks from him. Like, do you really need to prove that point? Is it so necessary to hold that above your partner? It just seems petty and stupid, and I can't find a logical reason besides he's embarrassed about apologizing for something like that for making a big deal about it. If OP can let it go, surely OP's partner can let it go also. It just seems like a stupid sticking point to me. So I'm gonna go with not the a-hole on this one. I wouldn't want to make up yet either, but plenty of people have made up over worse situations than this, and I can't fault you if you do make up, because sometimes we just have to agree to disagree and move on. Anna Schema says... Not the a-hole, but those are some huge red flags. Apologizing will tell him he is right to go screaming about his assumption. You need to sit with him and have a calm, rational conversation about what you were mad about and how he could have acted differently. And if he's unwilling or incapable of doing so, then the relationship is probably doomed. Part of the process of unlearning toxic masculinity is unlearning the reactive disgust us guys are taught to express towards feminine hygiene things. And honestly, it's just blood. Not like it's poop or anything. Even if my significant other pooped the bed, my first reaction would not be anger and disgust, but worry. Same with urine. I'd assume that he's ill. I can't imagine waking up to my partner bleeding, even if it's only a period, and go straight to yelling at her for it. What a dick. Seriously, I woke up in the middle of the night once and realized that I had wet the bed. I was mortified. But I woke up my wife and we got up, changed the sheets and both showered before going back to bed. We had a bed liner due to having a newborn. We had bonus for the win. Next morning, I was expecting her to have an adverse reaction to it. No, more like, hey, You've talked about seeing a therapist for PTSD symptoms before. Maybe we need to revisit this topic because Exhibit P? Long story short, that's what I did, and am much better now. Probably wouldn't have done it without her support. Lightworthy09 says, Not the a-hole. He's a grown-ass man. His lack of education is his own fault, and no one else's. As other people have already said, a man who doesn't know how the reproductive system works has no business having sex with anyone. I had an unexpected period start when I was staying the night with my husband when we first started dating. I left early for work, so he mentioned it to me later that day. I was mortified and apologized over and over and offered to replace the sheets, and he laughed at me. <laughs> it's fine, I already washed them and put them back on the bed. It's not like you did that on purpose which is the only correct response. This is a much better response, yes. He sounds sweet. You're right. Being mature enough to have sex means being mature enough to deal with the embarrassing bodily things that happen. And Judge Jed 100 says, Not the a-hole. 1. He shouted at you first. 2. He's 23 years old. Using school as an excuse doesn't fly. He's had plenty of time to educate himself. Three, he treated it as if it was a serious biohazard that needed to be dealt with majorly. And four, he tried to turn it around and make you responsible for how he acted. For real. And numbers one and four are really the kicker. Yes, it's bad that he doesn't know periods can be irregular, and it's annoying that he thinks it's gross. Though, if he hasn't experienced this before, I can imagine it may be shocking. Like when I got my first period and stained my own sheets. 
They were heavy periods and it was freaky the first time. But his first reaction was to yell at OP and then double down and make excuses for his behavior. And that's a deliberate choice. He could have easily been freaked out or even uneasy about the blood, but said something like, are you okay? Instead of, ew, you're disgusting. Posted by user goodads6014. Titled, Am I the a-hole for letting my kids live in filth? So I'm currently a stay-at-home mum to four kids, a 10, 8, 2, and 1-year-old. As you can imagine, the house gets messy if I don't keep on it constantly. Throughout this pandemic, everyone has been home. Hubby is working from home, my 10-year-old and 8-year-old are distance learning, and the babies are... Well, they're babies. They're always home. This normally isn't a problem for me. I have to clean a bit more and help my older ones with school, but all in all, not too much has changed for myself. My family, on the other hand, seem to think being home all day every day is grounds to be lazy 24-7. I do not put up with this, but somehow, my floor is a catch-all. When I talk to everyone, or discuss some chore charts, everyone agrees with me then goes right back to normal. The older kids have completely lost their allowance due to this. On to the incident. A little under a week ago, I told everyone it's their responsibility to clean. I would still wipe stuff down, wash the dishes, do laundry and mop slash vacuum, but it was up to everyone else to put dishes in the sink, clothes in the hamper, and make sure surfaces and floors are picked up enough for me to do my part. My family has done none of this, and to be honest, I'm probably kind of a dick about it. Oh, you don't have anything to eat off of? Guess you should have put the dishes in the sink. I do still feed everyone. Oh, you tripped over the crap in the floor? Maybe it would help if you picked it up. My family is slowly getting the hint and are coming up with a plan to tackle the mess. My mother-in-law thought it was a good idea to make a surprise visit and saw the state of my house. She was disgusted and proceeded to bitch me out for not doing my job. I told her I'm not doing my job plus hers by teaching my husband slash her son and my kids how to pick up after themselves. She threw a fit and threatened to call CPS for letting my family live in filth. I told her to get out of my house. My husband has apologized, but I'm starting to feel bad. Am I the a-hole? OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I feel like the ass because it's my job to care for everyone. While that may be true in some regards, it's not entirely true. It's not entirely your job to care for everyone. Your husband also has obligations to care for everyone in the family, and that includes you as well. And it seems like the way he's approaching the house by not picking up the slack, by not disciplining the kids for not doing their fair share, and expecting you to pick up most of the load, it just shows that he doesn't care, and he will continue not to care unless something changes. Your mother-in-law is going off the rails for this one. She saw a problem, one that really isn't too bad, and then she jumped into a pool of just toxicity and was like, I'm calling this Child Protective Services. How dare you have a filthy floors? What is this? You're a woman like me. We need to be cleaning everything. That's our jobs. This is your fault. This can't be my husband's fault. It's like textbook r slash just no mother-in-law, crazy entitled woman paradox, whatever. Those sort of freakouts don't fly in reality, and I cannot, I cannot blame you for kicking her out. That's unnecessary stress, that's uncalled for, she's crazy, I hate her. Yes, there's always more that we can do to help, and there's more that people can do to be a better influence in the house. I can't say that you've been the best, and I can't say that you've been the worst influence. You're a person, you're a human, we make mistakes, and we don't always do the best because that's human. All you can do from here on out is do your best every day, come together with the family, talk to them more, tell them about the crazy mother-in-law and how she's not speaking logically, she's just speaking stupidly. And I can't fault you for how things have gone so far. I'm gonna go with not the a-hole for this one. Sol Mayet 122 says, Not the a-hole. You're a stay-at-home mum, not a slave. The children, 
I'm including your husband in that, should do the bare minimum of tidying up after themselves. Your mother in law is so unbelievably far out of line, threatening to call child protective services on you, and you had every right to kick her out. Calling CPS would be reporting both parents anyway. CPS does not assign chores to one parent or another. Both would be held responsible, and both would be investigated. This shows how much mother in law sees her son as a little kid who should be babied by his wife. Gross. Swissy Queen says, Not the a-hole. It's good that your husband apologized and honestly, your husband needs to step up because if he doesn't do his part, the children just learn from him and that it's okay not respecting mum's work and time. Yeah. You really need to sit down with him and crack down on this because it's pretty clear that the kids are taking his lead in this situation. And it's a bad lead that's going to lead to a lot of fighting when they're older and having to deal with housemates or something with no intention or obligation to clean up after them. And Mean Thought says, Not the a-hole. Also, I would consider never allowing mother-in-law in your home again if she thinks it's truly okay to threaten you with calling CPS. A decent mother-in-law might ask if everything is okay. Ding ding ding. Someone who wants to call CPS as a first action is not okay. What was she going to say? My dear son is home all day, but his wife doesn't clean enough. She should be apologizing to OP if she wants to visit ever again. Not the a-hole. Posted by user CG3490764, titled... Am I the a-hole for not letting my son's former fiancé see him? I have a deceased son named Adam. Adam passed away two months ago. He was only 21 years old and was suffering from a chronic heart condition. He introduced me to his then-girlfriend when he was 19 and told me they were expecting a baby and wanted to get engaged. I supported them with all I could, although I still helped with medical expenses. He was working a job, studying and paying bills. He was exhausted but excited to be a dad, and he loved his son more than himself. Three months after his son was born, Adam's condition got worse. He spent time in and out of the hospital. He was in a wheelchair, and he was too weak to walk but was aware of what was happening. His fiance moved back with her parents. After my son requested to see his baby, she declined and didn't allow it. She didn't even visit, just called. I talked to her and told her Adam was at my home and she should come see him and bring their baby with her. She came, but only to give back the ring, saying this was too much for her and will not live like that. She said she wanted to move on and provide for her son. My son was devastated. Next thing we knew, she flew out of the country before we could even consult a lawyer. We knew nothing about where she was, and all means of communication were cut. It was hard watching my son sad missing his son. All he had of his baby were pictures. He was devastated, and he was melting like a candle in front of me, and I stood there helpless. I got him a medical device because he had trouble breathing on his own. Two months ago, he was admitted to the hospital. He had late-stage heart failure and was on a vent machine. The doctor was honest with me and said that Adam was too weak for another surgery. I was devastated. I let the family know what was happening, including Adam's friends. Turns out one of his friends was in contact with Adam's former fiancé on social media and told her. Next thing I knew was she was standing in front of me wanting to see Adam. I was surprised to see her. I politely told her to leave, but she insisted she brought mutual friends to try to convince me, but I refused, and I got mad and had to get the security officer involved, and she ended up being told to leave right then. She started yelling at me, and told me I had no right, called me cruel and other names that I can't say here. Adam's friends sided with her, and were yelling at me too. I felt too much pressure. Adam passed away later that day at 6pm. I couldn't take it. I found myself dealing with her and their friends yelling at me again. My brother thought what I did was wrong. The funeral wasn't quiet nor peaceful as I had to argue with everyone pointing out what I did was cruel. I was carrying my grief along with this. 
She again stopped me from seeing my grandbaby as a way to spite me for what I did. I know there has to be something I can do. This is my grandbaby. I need to answer two questions. She didn't show up with the baby. I don't think she even brought him with her on her trip, and Adam was already unconscious that day. He was unconscious for days. And OP has offered the following explanation for why they think they might be the a-hole. I realize what I did might be seen as cruel, as everyone thinks. I don't think this is a hard one to answer. I feel like this is a clear not the a-hole. This woman just up and walked out on this man, jumped to another country with his son, as soon as there was a sign of his condition getting worse. In that case, unless she came back and set things right with OP's son before he died, then there is no coming back from that. That's way more egregious than OP not allowing her to see him before he passes. If he wasn't unconscious before that, I'm sure he would have told her to piss off too. Like, that's a very heartless thing to do to someone. There is very little coming back from that. I feel like OP is justified in her actions, and I completely support it. So I'm going with not the a-hole. Yes, it can be seen as cruel, especially by the friends and family who could be told another story by this woman, but once the truth comes out, I'm pretty sure they would side with OP. And if they don't, then those aren't people you need in your life. Random user 133 says, Not the a-hole. She left him when he needed her the most. She had no right to be there. She wasn't his fiancée anymore. You don't leave someone who you love in hard times. She was cruel for leaving him and not letting him see his son, not you. I'm sorry for your loss, OP. Stay strong. Sounds like the baby mama has a heart condition too. It's called not having one. Not the a-hole. She knowingly got into a relationship with someone suffering from a heart condition. A condition which, might I add, you paid the medical bills for, and then abandoned the guy when it got too real, even keeping him away from his son. For all you knew, you were being protective of him, even if your actions were probably also rooted in some spite. I'm very sorry for your loss. I can forgive deciding that it's more than she can deal with, even if she initially thought she could handle it. Running off with his child and going no contact is a complete a-hole move, though. Info. She abandoned him, took their child, and now wants to pretend she cares? However, I do have a question. Did you ask Adam what he wanted? Do you think Adam would want to see her, or would find it too distressing at the time? I do think that the person being cruel is the one sending flying monkeys to crap on you when you were the one taking care of him. And OP replies... All he ever talked about was his son. From what I understand, she came without him, so she had no intentions of letting us see the baby. Adam was already unconscious when she came, and it was sudden, and I didn't expect her to come back. I'm going not the a-hole, because the only person who would benefit is the woman who abandoned him, not Adam himself, since he was unconscious. She doesn't get to pretend she's his grieving widow when she stole his child from him. I'm betting she's doing this because she knows she's a crap person and didn't get to do some performative nonsense to cleanse her own conscience. I'd point out that she didn't show up with the child, so Adam could have theoretically say goodbye and that you've been doing all the work caring for him. Anybody who doesn't understand that should be blocked. She probably wanted to see if her son was getting any inheritance, life insurance, etc., if you wanted to cleanse your own conscience, you wouldn't attack OP or make a scene at the funeral. Definitely some food for thought on that one. Posted by user The Spiciest Bagel. Titled, Am I the a-hole for telling my brother I met his new girlfriend at an AA meeting? So my brother started dating this new girl, and I realized I recognized her from Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not an addict, but my lawyer recommended I attend some AA meetings to help strengthen an ongoing case against me. I know it's her because I remember her very unique name from the AA meeting, and she also talked for a very long time. I thought it was important to mention it to my brother because I'm worried about her as a partner to him. In AA, she mentioned that not only did she use hard drugs, but that also she feels like she can't control herself. 
She also admitted to drugs, making her verbally abusive and unstable emotionally. And at the time, she was not sober. I know my brother, and I know that he holds himself and his partners to a high standard, and that he hates drama in his relationship. I told him what she said, and he broke up with her. And she basically stalked me and also called me an untrustworthy tramp who ruined her experience with AA. Honestly, I think I was just trying to help my brother out, but some of my friends think it was messed up for me to tell him. But I think it's better for him to know what kind of person she is ahead of time. Am I the a-hole? Edits, to clear some things up because people are assuming a lot. I'm fighting my case because I believe the legal system is corrupt, but I want to be accountable in other ways. I don't regularly drink and drive. I don't even drink at all. The night was the worst night of my life, and I would take it back in a heartbeat. All I'm asking is opinions on how I should have handled the situation with this girl. Not to talk about whether I deserve to rot in jail because of my DUI. I do not condone drinking and driving, and think it's a very serious crime, and I understand the gravity of my actions. I admit, I read some comments just to get a little more insight on this one before I did, and yeah, this first comment talks about, did you forget the second A stands for anonymous? Also, no excuse for DUI. What the hell is that? You continued to dig yourself deeper into a hole the further you went. I applaud you for your honesty, and I really love it when people are completely transparent on this one, but in this regard, it didn't help your case, and it didn't help me sympathize with you any more than when you started this. There's obviously some agenda going on here. You look down on this woman who's going out for help. She wants help, that's why she's in this group, and yet now you've completely undone all of that. I can understand that you would do things like this to protect your family members because you don't want to see them be abused and everything. But in this instance, you've just shown us that's the pot calling the kettle black. You DUI'd. You put other people in danger. Should we avoid you as well? And you are going to Alcoholics Anonymous not to get help but to prove that the system is corrupt? You're fighting some demons yourself here. What are you doing? You're the a-hole. Cerebral Assassin says, You're the a-hole. Did you forget to mention the second A stands for anonymous? Most go to these things to get help, not to try and make a fake showing for court because they can't get a DD. I can't get over how this person just decided that there is nothing they can learn. Even if you are not an addict, you think you can't learn something from people actively trying to overcome something difficult and make themselves better? Really, OP? You don't find that admirable? You'd rather ruin the sanctity of the meeting and put their anonymity and recovery at risk. You're the a-hole. Yeah, 56 says, you're the a-hole. You are a gigantic a-hole. Do you not know the definition of the word anonymous? It is completely wrong to reveal anything people talked about in those meetings. That is their safe space and you just violated it. I just have to comment again, you are a drunk who endangered others' lives by drinking and driving, hence your own DUI. But you have the nerve to judge her and tell your brother things she revealed in an anonymous meeting? You have a lot of nerve. The a-hole here for sure. And Karath Solis says, you're the a-hole. You expect us to not hold a DUI over your head and you went and did exactly that to somebody else? Nothing like holding somebody's past mistakes over their head when they're trying to get help. And now on to the updates. My reception last time was not very positive, and I realized that my approach at the time wasn't the best. So in this update, I'm going to try and be emotionless as possible, and just give you guys the facts. I showed my brother the thread. We talked about it. He told me he thinks I have a drinking problem. That was hard to hear. He also reached out to his ex, and I don't know the results of that. I reread my replies. The stories about drunk drivers killing loved ones hit me the hardest. I felt a lot of guilt realizing what I did, and went into a depression spiral. I think everything I bottled up came out, and I quit my job. I emailed the AA group leader with a lengthy apology. She was upset, of course, but was very kind. I'm banned from AA, but she matched me with someone to talk to. 
I texted my brother's ex with an apology and an offer to meet up in person. She didn't reply for a few days. Eventually she did and said that she acknowledges, but also went in on me and went into detail about how much pain I caused her. She said she cannot forgive me yet. I talked to my lawyer, and we're trying to figure out the logistics of a guilty plea without conviction, because he thinks that what I did in AA may affect my case. I'll likely get my license revoked and have to pay a fine. I'm currently jobless, and I'm probably going to move back in with my parents until I can be better. There is also a tweet going around saying someone knows me and outed me to my brother. This did not happen. This person was trying to capitalize on a messed up situation for internet points. My brother and I have never met nor interacted with this person. At the moment, I am still very depressed. I'm trying to right my wrongs, but I don't think I can ever do that. However, I think that this was going to come eventually, and the thread didn't make me depressed. It was the consequences of my own actions. Thank you for helping me see the pain I was causing before it was too late. Edit. I'm not banned from AA in general, just the AA meeting that I went to. And Sinker12 comments, My mum's a recovering alcoholic. She used to drive drunk all the time. Got her license revoked, paid heavy fines, none of it was getting through to her. Finally, she took AA seriously, and she's been sober for I think seven years. You've done the hard part. Not saying it's going to be easy from now on, but you seem to have hit your rock bottom. Now you just have to find a way to climb back up. Get some counselling for your feelings of depression. That can often help with alcoholism too. I'm glad you're moving back in with your parents. Have them hold you accountable to stopping drinking and getting help. I mentioned my mum to say it gets better. It truly does. You did bad things, but that doesn't make you a bad person. We call people a-holes on this page all the time. But in truth, most of them are just humans who make jokes. You've made a mistake. You've done what you can to fix it. Now you work to prevent more. Great job doing this. Seriously. OP, I truly commend you for listening to everyone and taking the time and consideration to accept your mistakes and go on the process of learning from them. That takes true strength, and not everyone has that. It will get better, as long as you make the effort to do so. I wish you the best of luck. Sam Renee says, I still don't think you understand the severity of your actions. You deserve jail time whether or not you think the justice system is broken. You deserve to lose your license. Literally anything the judge sentences you to, you deserve. People who don't ever drink are not drinking and driving. I've worked with people in recovery. My professional work has been all related to AOD, and the crap you pulled makes me so ragey. And Chocolate Soy Milk says, I just got home from a 30-day stint in rehab on Tuesday. 35 days clean today. And this post in the original break my heart. Your view of her and her alcoholism slash addiction versus yours mirrors so many of the stories I've heard. My crap ain't as bad as yours, so I don't really need to be here and it's denial at its finest. Being open, vulnerable, and accepting are so important in those meetings and in recovery in general. Her story was not one for you to tell. It would kill me if any of my fellow rehab mates outed me. I hope you understand and get the help you need. You obviously have a problem, so don't give up on AA and find another home group. Just work through it like they say, one day at a time. Our next post is by user Babe Miller, titled, Am I the a-hole for calling my mother-in-law by her last name instead of grandma? So, my relationship to my mother-in-law, Mrs. Smith, is crap. She's called to me because I kept my last name, Miller. She says I'll treat her like family when she wants to be part of it. She calls me Jake's friend. My husband Jake loves me all the same. He doesn't bother standing up to her because it's a way for her to start a fight. We rarely talk to her. She makes no effort, so neither do we. Jake and I had discussed whose last name our kid would have prior to the birth. 
he initiated the conversation. I'd left the decision up to him. After the birth, the families visited at the hospital. Jake asked what our son's last name was going to be. I told him it was still his choice. He smiled and said, Little baby Miller, I like it. He filled out the paperwork. Mother-in-law looked livid. She started asking questions, but my dad started crying. Both of my brothers have died. Dad has never mentioned it, but I know passing the last name down makes him happy. Neither Jake or I anticipated this, nor did it for this reason, but it was sweet all the same. After she left, mother-in-law let people know what I had done, and how now she wouldn't feel like a grandmother. A month later, a sister-in-law announced her pregnancy. Mother-in-law said, Finally, I'll feel like a grandmother. Again, my husband didn't say anything, and neither did I. Our son started talking. During a video call where my mother-in-law did nothing but gush about sister-in-law's daughter, who was adorable, Jake was trying to get the baby to talk. Son lost interest, I took son and Jake and let mother-in-law ramble some more before ending the call. Mother-in-law said she wanted to say bye to son. Jake turned to the phone. Mother-in-law said, Say bye to grandma. Make son say it, I'm grandma now. I snapped inside so I said, Bye Mrs. Smith. And my mother-in-law's face dropped. Jake turned the camera away and said bye quickly. He laughed, said I was awesome, but we better put our phones on silent. The only call and text I responded to was the other sister-in-law, who said I didn't need to go out of my way to be nasty. That mother-in-law went around saying how excited she was about son, which was a lie. That her initial comments were understandable because I talked Jake out of tradition. I did not! And that I'd hurt mother-in-law. Mother-in-law needed time to adjust. I said... Thank you for your input. Mother-in-law texted eventually, saying I'd really upset her. I said, Here I was, trying to respect the importance you feel to last names. You've said multiple times I'm not family because of my last name. You made it more than clear that that's the reason my child doesn't make you feel like a grandma. Now you'll be known as Mrs. Smith. She said sorry. She didn't mean it that way, but that my dad's reaction was an example of how important last names are. I now had to forgive her because family. It made me angrier that she brought my dad into this, and I can't tell if I'm being the a-hole or not. Yeah, I'm going to go with not the a-hole for this one. She obviously slighted you from the get-go, can't accept that... Oh, you know, people don't always take their last name. Sometimes you can put it as a spouse's last name. Yes, it's uncommon, but it's not unheard of. I don't know where this grandma gets off on creating this drama, and that's definitely not a visual image I wanted to give myself there, and I'm sorry for everyone that had to visualize that. But seriously, get off your high horse, mother-in-law. It's a name. The kid is still your grandkid. Where, where, where? He's not got my last name, so he's not really my grandchild. Jesus Christ. I just have no words. I'm gonna go with not the a-hole. That's just too much. Whatever whatever eight says, your husband is right. That was awesome. F that noise. Not the a-hole, stick to your guns on this. When you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, and she is the showcase showdown champion now. Too tall to function says, not the a-hole. If she needs her son's biological son to have the same last name as her to feel a connection or commitment to him, then she's not a good person. She's superficial and vapid. She doesn't get to shun you and treat you and your son like strangers for however long, and then turn around and demand empathy or an apology from you. Tangled Twisted says, Not the a-hole. She kept pushing it and pushing it. You had every right to react that way. She is definitely the a-hole here. I will say, if you guys choose to have and want a relationship with her and the rest of his family, then it may be a good idea not to push the Mrs. Smith over Grandma with your son in the future now that you've made your point. With style, I might add. And she has gone out of her way to ensure that you felt uncomfortable and were not part of her family. She even went so far as to give your son the same treatment. 
She even said, make him call me grandma. I'm a grandma now. As if she wasn't before. You simply went along with what she's already been enforcing, and that's on her, not on you. She's reaping what she's sown, and she doesn't like it. Not the a-hole, and thank God your husband's on your side. Sounds like he knows what she's like and not only respects you, but considers you in all his decision-making. That's a rarity in this Reddit. You've got all the family you need, and she shouldn't get the benefits of calling you and your son family until she makes the effort to include you in it, along with a proper apology. And OP replies, He's a great guy. I really did luck out. I told him his relationship with his mother is his decision because I don't care if she likes me. I do want to revisit it now, though given our son is now involved. We seriously never see her or hear from her. I don't think Jake is going to miss her anyway. He really only likes his dad. Honestly, it sounds like Jake knows her well enough to know he doesn't want to have a typical mother-son relationship with her. She also doesn't seem to be making any effort on her end to maintain the relationship with him, only getting upset when you kept your last name and when he made the decision to give your son your last name. I'm an outsider here, so I'm not privy to the details, but it seems like her love is... Uh, very conditional? Safe to say that. I think it's why sister-in-law texted me. She gets money out of mother-in-law for standing by her. Next time, ask if she's paid by the text or by the word. <laughs> Thank you. This made me laugh out loud. And OP puts some edits in their post. And the first one says, Edit. Thank you again to everyone who gave awards. It was very kind of you, and I do appreciate it. Jake is home, and I had him read the post. Some of you really cracked him up. Some made good points, which we have discussed. Apparently, he also got a text from his sister and asked how much money she got from mother-in-law for telling me off. He also made sure to tell sister-in-law who had the baby that we hold nothing against her, should mother-in-law try to spin it that way. She knows mother-in-law better, thankfully. Jake would also like to tell those who are telling me I should take his name that he disagrees and he's not about the sexism you're spewing. Though he does now want to send mother-in-law a Christmas card from the Millers. Edit 2. You guys are being great. I woke up to many more responses than I anticipated. Thank you. Just to clarify, my son will not be calling mother-in-law Mrs. Smith. They barely have a relationship as he's still a baby and mother-in-law makes no effort. After some discussion, Jake is going to take time to figure out what he wants from mother-in-law and if he thinks that's possible. And now on to the update. Jake and I appreciated all the support, though Jake wants the DMers to know that he's okay with me taking his balls because he loses everything anyway. This brought him a good chuckle before the serious talk. We both also wanted to be very clear that taking his name was never on the table, nor does he care. I also do want to say that I know how great Jake is, though since the post he's been demanding I thank the world's best husband any time he does something for me. His humour is my favourite part of him. Now, because it's his mum, I let him decide how to handle it. We both did agree that our son would obviously know mother-in-law as his grandma, but he wouldn't have a relationship with her unless she addressed the blatant favouritism. That conversation did not go well. She denied having favourites, lied about pretty much everything, then told me the compromise she was willing to make was that if she had to accept me for who I am, being that I kept the name, I'd have to accept her for who she is. I didn't respond before Jake ripped into her about how she didn't get to make demands, that she was critical of me, assumed things that he already told her weren't true, that this conversation wasn't happening because we didn't accept who she was. He said if he ever heard her make another comment about the Miller last name, he'd take it. She started crying about losing her family and he hung up. One sister-in-law, who was mother-in-law's favourite child, sent me a nasty message, including the line, I wonder if your dead brother would be happy that you used him to break mother-in-law's heart. I sent the screenshot to mother-in-law and said, call off your dog or I'll take her to the pound. 
I have sent a screenshot of that to anyone who has tried to question me. If they tried to defend mother-in-law and sister-in-law, I blocked them. Word got around quickly about this, and now sister-in-law is all but cut out of father-in-law's side of the family. Even father-in-law has come down on her hard. Sister-in-law is desperately trying to apologize and fix this. She even allowed Jake to read everything mother-in-law sent to her about my last name. I tried to read some of it, but stopped. I don't want to be angry. I'm taking time to decide how to handle this. I am happy to be done with mother-in-law. She never really bothered me. It does take a lot to get to me, but I don't want her behavior and attitudes being normalized with my son. I wasn't prepared for motherhood to have such a strong effect. Jake did admit he gave son my last name for my dad. Years ago, my dad asked if Jake was going to propose to me. Jake said if my dad wanted to know, he would give him a heads up, but he wouldn't ask for his blessing or permission. In many more words, Dad said he never had any expectations of that. He didn't worry about gender roles, though he was glad he would gain a son again. Jake didn't feel obligated. He just wanted to do that for my dad. Sincerely, thank you all. Edit. Hey everyone, I didn't expect to wake up to the amount of messages I did. I appreciate them all. Jake takes both the compliments and the insults, as do I. I also want to clear up some questions. Yes, this is real, but I'm not going to prove that. Mother-in-law took father-in-law's name. They are divorced. They have two daughters and two sons. Brother-in-law intends to have children and will pass on the Smith name. Sister-in-law has a daughter who has sister-in-law's husband's name. Sister-in-law also took his name. The youngest sister-in-law is the one who sent the text. I'm not going to apologize for how I spoke to mother-in-law after she encouraged her daughter to use my brother like that. There is text proof that mother-in-law did this. Sister-in-law showed Jake. I have no intentions on seeking therapy or a relationship with either of them, and that's the most that can be asked of me in this upset of a state. If and when we have a second child, I always intended for them to get Jake's last name. Jake knows and is cool with it. Jake is willing to be called by my last name, but I doubt he'll actually change it. Neither of us are willing to do paperwork out of spite either. Yes, I still cry remembering my dad cry about this. I always assumed Jake did this for this reason. He really is a great man. And in the comments, Spargo says, You've got yourself a great husband. Not a lot of people could stand their ground like he did. Good luck to both of you and your little son. He's always been able to stand up for himself. I won't say it didn't get to him, especially what his sister did, but he just runs it out. He may also make himself a world's best husband t-shirt if he sees more compliments, but he does deserve it. And thank you. Would he consider changing his name to Miller, or would that just put more gasoline on the fire? Yes, he would but he tries to not let anger make his decisions. I also don't think he would because of the paperwork required, and he does everything he can to avoid it, including bribing me to do it. That line, call your dog off or I'll take her to the pound, so bloody good. I didn't mean it violently either. Just keep your yapping dog in your yard or I'll make it someone else's problem. Sister-in-law is still yapping, just more whiny now. I don't think she realized her family would draw a line in the sand. The majority aren't necessarily taking our side, but it's clear they're staying out of it because defending her isn't really an option. She had it coming. She should have known that you wouldn't just sit back and take her crap. Well, I'm sure her mother compensated her well for it. Sister-in-law never really liked me much anyway. This has been mentioned twice now, so I gotta ask, what's the deal with the money angle? Does mother-in-law pay for support? How monetary is her relationship with her daughter and others? This is super concerning, to be honest. She just takes her son on shopping sprees when sister-in-law has pleased her. Sister-in-law gets much nicer gifts than everyone else, and is randomly, but not actually randomly, treated to gifts. 
like how she happened to get a really nice new car when she started refusing to see father-in-law during his time. It's very concerning for someone else, I'm sure, but my sister-in-law is not, and will not, be my problem, ever. Hold on. Your mother-in-law and father-in-law aren't even married anymore? She's decided to nuke her own family over her ex-husband's last name? She just kept saying, it's the way it's done. That's good enough for her, I guess. And Titus Favonius says, F your sister-in-law. My brother died last year, and if someone said some crap like that to me, I'd never speak to them again. She won't be hearing from me for a long time. I am livid. Especially after some of the texts I saw. Jake says that I get to decide how to handle it, even though she's his sister. I don't think he ever thought that she'd do that, but he's disappointed all the same. I'm so sorry. I lost my brother at the age of 16, and I've been begging my husband to let me name our hypothetical firstborn son after him. What sister-in-law did is cruel, and I hope you put her in a very long time out. Mother-in-law is an ass too. Glad your husband has a shiny spine for you and Bub. I wanted my son to have his own first name, but I demanded the middle name by one of my brothers. When we have another, the other name will be used. And the last comment by Grumble Muffin, happy for you both. Y'all sounded like you're both focused on protecting and nurturing what's important, your son and each other. Our son will always come first. We don't always agree what that means, but in this case, we both know it means no bullcrap from family. I wasn't ready to be as passionate about it as I was, as Jake initially didn't see the big deal. But he listened to my anger, and frankly, isn't attached enough to his mother to care. Sister-in-law heard him more, admittedly. G'day there guys, and that's the end of today's episode. I do hope you enjoyed it, and were entertained by today's bloody good content. As always, I want to do a quick shout out and a thank you to all my channel members and Patreon subscribers. Your beautiful faces and names will be up on screen right now. Haven't forgot about you guys, sorry I was taking a little break there. So yeah, if you see yourself, give yourself a pat on the back. If you want to be on this screen, there's links down in the description below where you can sign up and help support the channel and all future projects that I'm going to be doing on this one. With all that said, I hope you guys have an amazing day, night, sleep, whatever you're up to. I'll see you in the next episode, and I do hope you enjoy it. Thank you.